Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning uh, around the world. I'm very grateful to have you all on this uh, great event today. Uh, as you all know, we are in a very, very special year in a difficult year. Uh, the COVID crisis is uh, keeping us in our homes around the world. But the climate, uh, climate protection and climate policy must go on. And that's why we are here today on the En Route to COP event. I'm very happy to uh, be joined uh, by a lot of VIPs today, and I'm very honored to be able to open this event. I'm myself, I'm, my name is Daniel Moser. I'm management head of the Transformative Urban Mobility Initiative. It's an initiative which aims to tackle implementation of sustainable urban mobility around the world. And we're working with a lot of great partners who are also with us on this call today. And I believe that we need to find the practical milestones towards uh, the COP26 in the next year. We need to look at what we can practically achieve and what we can do to make uh, climate change um, not a reality which is awaiting us, but uh, that we can change uh, uh, the future of mobility towards zero carbon transport. So I would like to encourage you to tag en route to COP when you do uh, tweets en route to COP26. This is our hashtag for today. And I'm very happy also to uh, give the floor to our keynote speakers who have just joined our call. And I'd like to, uh, first of all, give uh, the stage to uh, the Minister for the Environment of the Netherlands. She is also chairwoman of the Transport Decarbonization Alliance. Please, uh, Ms. Uh, Stintje van Helthoven, go ahead. And uh, we're looking forward to your uh, keynote speech. Well, thank you so much and let me give a warm welcome to all of you. It's really great to be here. Welcome to this online event uh, on the road to COP26 uh, and what an important road that is going to be. Our road to the Glasgow Change Conference in November 2021 and it's a journey we're taking together towards a sustainable future. And it's uh, a COP which should not just result in negotiations, it should also result in action and in concrete commitments. Uh, we've organized this event to accelerate momentum and accelerate the transition to zero carbon transport. We want to step up action and deliver an ambitious package at COP26. COP26 is the next stop on our journey. We're traveling with a clear idea of what we want to achieve and where we want and need to go. Basically, a green planet, clean air, healthy people, new jobs and a circular economy. And there's nothing romantic about building a zero emission future. It is paramount that we do so. And there is a saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. But we need to go fast as well as far. This is a race to zero, a good race to the bottom for once. And the greater thing about it is if we win, we all win. And I applaud the climate champions who are providing this framing for our common journey. But it's not a stroll in the park. It's really a proper expedition. We'll have to travel together because this is about systemic change. And we can only travel if we travel together. We all have a role to play, really each and every one of us. None of us can speed up alone. I think that is reflected in our conference program of today and in the many organizations that have co-created this event. As chair of the Transport Decarbonization Alliance, I would really like to thank all of them for their hard work and their great contributions. It's really fantastic to see how you're pulling this. There are many dimensions to the challenge of decarbonizing transport, which play out differently also in different parts of the world. And so we really need to take that into account when developing our package of action. I'm really pleased that there is a special session on transport challenges for small island developing states. And I also applaud the leadership of AOSIS on this issue. Every successful expedition is made up of individuals, each sharing their own expertise and commitment. And so that's also why I'm looking for you for this. So this event offers a wide variety of sessions, including on national climate and transport strategies, low carbon urban mobility planning, delivering zero emission freight, also rethinking, reorganizing and prioritizing urban mobility in space. Like we said yesterday in the meeting, Recarbonizing transport is also about avoiding unnecessary transport and about organizing urban planning and health and transport. 
So what is on the progress on the program today? Basically, we need to get into the fast lane. We need to accelerate. We are not on track. Uh, transport emissions are still rising. So zero emission transport worldwide is essential to keep climate change in check. Trucks, they are at, account for only 2% of the vehicles on the road. Yet in the EU, they are responsible for 22% of carbon emissions from transport. And this figure is on the rise. So for me, the conclusion is very simple. We need to speed up and we can, the technology is there, it's cost effective if you account for fossil emissions. So basically it is a market failure that we have to solve. And we know perfectly from other markets how that works. We can solve market failures. We can set standards. We can use public procurement. We can provide incentive. And we can invest in charging infrastructure. Together, we can create that effective mix that will enable both companies and consumers and governments and cities to join the race to zero in transport. We need to spur the market for zero emission passenger vehicles to get it past the tipping point. So I'd really like to compliment the UK on its initiative to set up Zero Emission Vehicle Transport Council, which aims to increase the pace of transition for zero emission passenger vehicles. COVID-19 is imposing travel restrictions on us all, but it also brings us together in this virtual laboratory. I don't think I've had as many international meetings as, uh, this year as I have in the past years. And I hope it's the same for you because these interactions are so crucial into getting actually things off the ground. The pandemic is forcing us to rethink the fabric of our societies. It is showing us that global connectedness and supply chains are under pressure and vulnerable. That is a long-term challenge. And in the so shorter term, we face challenges, for instance, to restore confidence in public transport. But I think it really creates opportunities as well. Decreasing rush hour peaks, for instance, make our transport system so much more efficient. Working from home decreases emissions and use of resources. I've asked WRI, the World Resources Institute, to look into this and you will hear more about it in the session on green recovery. Their findings confirm our thinking. If we act in a timely manner, this is a bit of a spoiler, but <laughs> that's why you know, if we act in a timely manner, if we act smart and decisively, we can reap the full benefits of transport decarbonization in post-COVID recovery. And I'm sure you all want to know much more about that. I'm pleased to see that in so many places of the world, COVID has given real boost to active travel, notably cycling and walking, and it's become part of the post-COVID recovery plans too. So in short, we have the ideas, now we need to scale up and grow innovative business models. For this, we could launch a transport decarbonization investment series, TDI, together with World Bank and WRI. At COP26, that series could deliver specific investment recommendations on overcoming investment barriers, for example, on active travel, scaling up e-buses, leapfrogging and rethinking public transport, so crucial for so many countries in the world, to charging infrastructure and zero emission transport. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a common vision, uh, common ambitions, and I hope this conference will end in a call for action because we are all, each of us, drives for change. We need to be bold and precise, and let's not be afraid of freight. Freight may just be the heavy loader this transition needs. We know we can accelerate progress towards zero emission freight vehicles on the road if we set ourselves a target. 30% of the fleet will be zero emission by 2030. If we can do that, we'll be sending a very strong signal to the market, to both producers and fleet owners. So together with the state of California, I will be launching a process leading to a global MOU on zero emission freight. I hope that at the end of this three-day event, we will have more initiatives like this, more vehicles for transition and more drivers of change. I mentioned earlier that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. My slogan for our journey is, let's go far and fast together. I wish us a very safe and clean journey. I'm ready to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Stinje van Veldhoven. And indeed, these were uh, impressive uh, actions which you could show. This is great uh, to see a country uh, moving uh, ahead and the Netherlands surely is a leader when it comes to climate protection and also transport uh, policy. So we are very grateful to have you with us today. Thank you again for your remarks.
it's great uh, to, to hear uh, about your actions and your ambitions. Uh, so now I would also like to introduce our next uh, keynote speaker, uh, the Executive Secretary of the UNF uh, C, uh, Ms. Patricia Espinosa. Uh, everybody uh, knows you, Patricia. You are a great uh, leader of um, the UN climate process, and we are very, very happy to have you on board today to talk transport and to look at the decarbonization of the transport sector. Uh, Executive Secretary of uh, UNFCCC, Patricia Espinosa, please uh, go ahead, uh, please um, give us your keynote address. We are very, very eager to hear what you have to say today. Thank you very much and good morning to all. It is really a pleasure to share opening remarks with uh, the minister from the Netherlands, Stenje van Beethoven. Uh, thank you so much, Stenje, for your leadership. I want to uh, uh, really thank you also uh, for the hard work that you have been doing, not only now, but uh, already for so many years on crucial sectors. And uh, you are absolutely right. What we need in order to have a successful outcome of COP26 and to drive the transformation that is needed in the world is initiatives like this. Initiatives like, like the ones that you are um, a, a heading, that you are promoting, uh, that look at the financing side, look also at how to bring all the actors together. So thank you very, very much. Uh, it is a very crucial moment for the process of climate change to have this leadership. I want to acknowledge also the presence of the ambassador of Belize to the United Nations, Ambassador Felson. Um, so nice uh, to have you here. Uh, your voices are really critical and not just for today's deliberations, as I was saying, but for our ongoing climate change discussions and negotiations. As the head of the uh, Climate Change Secretariat, you can imagine how pleased I was to be in invited to a discussion entitled En Route to COP26. My current focus, and indeed our current focus, must now be on the ramp, on the run, run up to what I believe will be one of the most momentous COP today. What we accomplish together in the next 11 months may well predict the success or failure of our discussions next year in Glasgow, and in many ways, how humanity will be living in the coming decades. And while all industrial sectors are important in our climate change negotiations, the transport sector is a particularly critical one. And I say this because the sector touches all facets of economic and social life in all nations of the world. And the minister has just uh, um, uh, enlightened us with uh, many uh, very hard data on the importance of working in this sector. I recognize also that more than 90% of the energy of the transport sector is still coming from fossil fuels. Transport remains a complex sector to decarbonize, but it must be done. And this is why these initiatives are so important. Without immediate action, transport carbon emissions could reach 40% of total CO2 emissions by 2030, only in 10 years, and 60% by 2050. That would really mean that we would not be able to achieve the goals under the Paris Agreement. That is a recipe for disaster. But I'm very encouraged by the fact that so many public and private transport entities are taking bold action to avoid this scenario. Through the efforts of institutions, individuals, as well as national and local governments in recent years, we now have success stories from multiple st stakeholders and stakeholder groups on strategic ways to decarbonize the transport sector. The Getting to Zero Coalition in the marine sector and the Road Freight Zero Initiative that the minister is heading in the tr trucking sector 
are just two of the multiple endeavors involving an amazing cross section of transport shareholders, stakeholders, all trying to come forward with effective strategies to get us to net zero emissions by mid century. Such initiatives are great examples of the power of inclusive multilateralism. And, but as the minister was saying, we need much more if we want to succeed moving forward. In the nationally determined contributions, there is much room for improvement. Currently, less than 10% of NDCs set a transport CO2 emission reduction target. And only 4% identify specific transport measures to adapt to climate change. Simply put, that's not good enough. So I encourage both our private and public sector colleagues to advocate to their own governments to make their NDCs more robust and with stronger transport components. One thing is certain, low carbon transport solutions bring a wide range of sustainable development co-benefits, including of course, clean air, improved road safety, increased urban access and lower transport costs. And this fits into a larger picture. Dear colleagues, right now we have a chance that only comes around once every few generations to transition our social and economic models towards fair, inclusive and sustainable development. If we all pull in one direction, we can do it. That's why we welcome, we continue to urge governments as they roll out their financial plans post COVID-19 to make those plans as green and inclusive as possible. It's more than an investment in bricks and buildings, roads and railways. It's an investment in our long-term health, safety and prosperity. All of this takes hard work today and indeed some tough but necessary decisions. One thing is clear, we cannot get to zero emissions by 2050 without meeting our outstanding commitments for 2020. And we cannot get to 2050 without meeting the commitments of the Paris Agreement, including the submission and implementation of improved NDCs. The bottom line is this, failure to achieve carbon neutrality by mid-century, failure to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement, and ultimately failure to avoid runaway climate change will have dire consequences for every nation and every individual on this planet. We cannot let this happen. I know that with your help and your initiatives, you will not let this happen. So let's do it together. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Patricia Espinosa. Very grateful uh, to have you with us today and uh, thanks for your remarks. And I can see you now. I couldn't see you before, but it's great to be able to see you. Uh, so thank you again and, um, and um, hope we have the chance uh, to meet in person also in the future once the crisis uh, resolves. Um, so continue the good work. Me, yes, continue thank the good you very work. much. Thank you very much. Uh, so our, our next speaker is uh, Ambassador uh, Felsen. She's ambassador and a deputy permanent uh, representative in the permanent Republic of Belize in, to the UN. And uh, he's also deputy chairman of AOSIS. So thank you very much for joining us today. And we're looking forward uh, to hear your remarks. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, Mrs. Ambassador Felsen. Thank you very much, Danielle. And it's a pleasure to be on a panel with such distinguished speakers as the minister and um, the executive secretary of the UNFCCC secretariat. Um, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the organizers for inviting me to participate in the session. Um, Belize, as a chair of the Alliance of Small Island States, is very pleased to partner and contribute to this three-day event. We share the ultimate goal of spurring the highest possible 
um, action across all major emitting sectors, because we are indeed in the most consequential race for planetary sustainability, as so eloquently described by uh, Madame Espinosa and the um, minister, and that is the race to zero. In April, Belize, as a chair of IOSIS, hosted the Placentia Ambition Forum. The forum initiated discussions on what will be needed to support greater ambition in the transport sector with key focus on decarbonization and resilience building in SIS. Now, the decision to focus on transport was not accidental. It is, after all, as we've heard, a major contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions and therefore an important part of the ambition conversation. It is for SIDS an integral unifier for our people, um, an enabler for accessing core public services within islands, between islands, and a critical infrastructure for our major industries and our economies as a whole. And it is the one sector that was very dramatically impacted by the global lockdown in many ways, reminiscent of the impact of hurricanes, except that COVID-19 is a 10 month off the scale disaster persistently pummeling our people and our economies. Transport is front and center to SID's vulnerabilities. While climate change impacts every aspect of our livelihoods, transport systems are often disproportionately disrupted due to essential infrastructure being located in coastal and disaster prone areas. For land transport, major infrastructure makes up a large part of our public assets. And when small nations face immense infrastructural damage due to floods or storms on a periodic basis, Governments are faced with having to pick up the pieces and enact quick measures to restore mobility and accessibility. In SIDS, the adaptive capacity of these highly vulnerable transport networks receives limited or ad hoc attention as compared to mitigative transport initiatives, which focus on a longer time trajectory. COVID-19 laid bare our vulnerabilities and if we are to be better prepared for climate related systemic disruption, there needs to be an equal weighting of mitigation and adaptation. During the recent Race to Zero dialogues in December, we heard very striking figures on transport emissions and we've just heard them now again. And the reflection in the last NDCs as um, Madame Espinosa just highlighted. Um, in fact, it was only 8% of 166 NDCs that um, were submitted in 2015 to 2016 that included transport emission reduction targets. This means that transport not only lags in terms of its contribution to greenhouse gas emissions reduction, it is a major drag on efforts to curb those emissions. Transport, both land and maritime, is also underreflected in SIDS NDCs relative to its cumulative impact on emissions in our islands, often ranking among the top three GHG emitting sectors for most of the small islands. But still, I must say that small islands are demonstrating strong leadership in advancing a sustainable transport agenda for climate action. Many SIDS are engaged in elaborating national policies and targets for the integration of sustainable transport in their national plans. And in some cases, projects are already underway. And I wish to highlight three examples, one each from the SIDS region, the three SIDS regions. So in the Caribbean, Barbados has committed to achieving 100% renewable energy and carbon neutrality by 2030. In the Pacific, Nauru has enhanced both their port accessibility economic stability and climate resilience through the development of a fully climate resilient port. And in the ACE region, Cabo Verde's electric mobility policy aims to achieve electrification of vehicular fleet by 2050 with an initial milestone of 54% by 2030. And they're already well on their way with 17% electrification to date. These islands, exemplify the types of comprehensive and integrated actions that would ensure that the rapidly growing transport sector curbs its carbon footprint. Globally, 
and alignment of such efforts could see a tipping point for this sector from brown to green or blue when you come from an island. At the same time, from an island perspective, raising the ambition of the transport sector must include assurance of its resilience and sustainability in light of the negative impacts that we'll inevitably face with climate change. As such, transport infrastructure and technology deployed to SIDS needs to be climate proofed. Importantly, it will require targeted support from development partners, including to overcome structural challenges endemic to our small economies and to attract investments as well as achieve scale. The ambition we seek for achieving the Paris Agreement goals must be holistic. I would therefore add to where I started that the race to zero must be complemented by a race for resilience. It is not enough that we establish lofty targets that focus on industry. We must set ambitious targets that focus on people and the planet as the ultimate beneficiaries. After all, a low emission transport sector, as we've heard, has the potential for many co-benefits, including it can contribute to energy security, enhance resilience, decrease public expenditures, and increase social cohesion. Finally, neither race will be won without a global partnership committed to support these twin objectives. Raising the bar of ambition and spurring action requires coordinated implementation efforts and financial support provided by development partners. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Ambassador. Um, very interesting and very uh, engaging to hear what you're saying. And indeed, uh, this is a, a great element of a good strategy is that double um, being the double the, the twin track of resilience and um, uh, zero com so thank you very much uh, for for these remarks we would now go into a short q a and uh, i'm emphasizing uh, the short here so i think we have a minute for uh, each uh, speaker and would go with minister van feldhoven first um, uh, then uh, um, uh, you, Ambassador Felsen, and uh, then uh, Ms. Espinosa. Uh, so starting uh, with uh, uh, Stinti van Feldhoven, Minister van Feldhoven, uh, one question to you. If you could uh, define in concrete terms, how would success for sustainable low-carb transport at COP26 look like for you? I uh, would be very interested to hear what you could say in just one minute about this. No problem. I think uh, I would really like to see uh, this memorandum of understanding on freight uh, signed uh, by as many states as possible um, so that we start decarbonizing, for example, starting in our inner cities, decarbonizing transport in inner cities. You don't need long haul uh, for that yet, but you can clean up the air in those densely urban areas, benefiting the health of all of our citizens living there. So. Uh, one of two things of success, I would say, let's focus on freight next to passenger vehicles and let's get a clearer vision on what is needed in financing this transport decarbonization process. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with the World Bank and see if we can get some concrete recommendations so that other countries can then also speed up and scale up uh, by having the right uh, arrangements in place. So those two things I think will be paramount for me having uh, a, a worldwide memorandum of understanding on decarbonizing freight, uh, what, approximately 30% in 2030 would be great uh, for at least uh, developed states. And then uh, next to that, the investment uh, packages. Is that about Thank one and... <laughs> Oh yeah. If you have one more sentence, I think we can fit it in. Well, I mean, I, what, I, what I really hope is that like Patricia Espinosa said, this is, it is going to be so crucial that we have action at this COP. It's not just about the result of the negotiation, it's about the, what we do on the ground. Um, and I'm really convinced that if we work together, if governments set standards, if governments, let's say, create a market, then we can also get the industry to start producing, which will make it then easier to set higher norms and higher standards and get this ball rolling. So the only way we're going to achieve is by working together on this. Develop both the infrastructure and the policies and the incentives at the same time and do this jointly. We have 
a lot of experience in the Netherlands by just getting everybody in a room, putting them around the table, and then let's see, what do you need from me so that you can move forward? Uh, and if we all do, then we can really speed up things. That's the way we have, uh, we have had some progress in the Netherlands. Let me go to uh, the next question uh, to Ambassador Felsen. Um, very similar question, actually. Um, I would like to ask you also the same question, really. What would success for you look like towards COP26? And would really uh, be eager to hear what you have to say and what, 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 how you would define the success in terms of transportation going towards COP26? Great, thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, listen, the first thing is that we have to accept that decarbonization of the transport se sector is a global public good, um, full stop. Um, success for, for sustainable and low carbon transport at COP26 would then entail um, complementary treatment, as I just mentioned, of transport emission reduction, of, of climate proofing of transport infrastructure, and, and of course, um, nesting that within the whole context of sustainable development. And, and I've um, already explained the, the SIDS examples that could be followed. Um, with this in mind, I think it's very important that we look for opportunities for synergy so we can use the, the COP uh, platform to look for those opportunities for synergy. And because transport is so integral to all aspects of, of everyday life and the functioning of societies, the core benefits that transport reform delivers need to be better defined um, and leveraged in order to um, access the, the considerable funding required to pursue these efforts. And I think some of the, the recommendations and, and um, um, initiatives that the Minister of Netherlands just mentioned um, in her opening remarks um, really go a long way to, to looking at those opportunities for synergies. Um, I think a, a global alignment of efforts is absolutely needed, and that can be a signal that we get from the COP26. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks um, for giving us this insight from uh, your side. Uh, and now um, over to uh, Mrs. Spinoza. You uh, have a lot on your table for the next 12 months. And I would uh, love to hear, hear from your point of view what you think deserves the highest priority, what needs to be done in the next 12 months to get where uh, Minister uh, van Feldhoven and also Ambassador Felsen describe what we should reach in terms of targets. So I would uh, really be interested to, see, to hear from you, Ms. Espinosa, what needs to be done in the next 12 months. First of all, um, to say that I fully concur with the, the, the words by uh, the minister and also ambassador uh, from Belize. Uh, I think it is, uh, uh, you know, financing is important. Uh, specific projects, initiatives are important. But all together, first of all, I think uh, I would like to, to frame this within uh, the, the broader success of COP26 uh, to underline that it is really crucial that we all understand that the success at COP26 will not depend on one or two or just three decisions. It will depend of a lot of elements, a lot of outcomes coming together. And we have to realize also that expectations uh, in the public, in the, of course, in the climate change community, but by the public and in the public are extremely high. So we need to be very conscious that we need to work on many different streams simultaneously to be able to, at the end, harness a lot of um, a common understandings uh, agreements in the negotiations, but maybe even um, a, a more important than in the past, also to have um, very clear uh, ways to demonstrate action by all. And action by all because it is very clear that governments alone cannot make the transformation that is needed. We really need uh, action by all, and specifically action that is happening in the real economy. 
We need to have to evidence more climate action in the, cl in the transport sector. Uh, of course, as um, both the minister and the ambassador were saying, and I'm very, very glad that the UK presidency has included transport under its priorities. I certainly look forward to having um, the initiatives that have been uh, a, a, a presented by, by the minister uh, also really showcased at COP26 hopefully with a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of participants. Um, so on the other hand, exactly what needs to happen and uh, in, in order to evidence progress, uh, how are we going to do this? Uh, for example, if the leading markets can come to the COP ready to commit 100% zero emission vehicles by 2035. That's a very, very ambitious goal, but it's something that we should think about. Um, if support is provided to developing countries with national railways to develop full strategies to reach zero carbon by 2050. This is, for example, one of those um, sectors that really require a lot of uh, support in order to be able to uh, move ahead. Uh, support is also needed for developing uh, country cities to transform their transport networks. And I think uh, here we need to uh, remember that, uh, remind ourselves that many of the world's biggest cities are in developing countries, which means that their transport infrastructure needs to grow. It still needs to grow. I myself am coming from a developing country, Mexico, that has some of the biggest cities in, in the world. And um, I can testify the, difficult, the difficulties for um, governments in those cities uh, to really put in place infrastructure that is um, good, is clean, and provides a, really a good, safe, and healthy environment for everyone. And of course, we would welcome uh, at COP26 a significant increase in zero commitments from airlines, from ship owners and carriers compared to COP25. So there's, there's in, in the transport sector, as you can see, and as um, the minister and the ambassador are, say, are uh, expressing, there are enormous uh, really room for opportunity. Our way forward, no doubt, must include more ambitious measures to reduce emissions in the transport se sector. And it must happen, happen as rapidly as possible. And so yes, COP26 can only be a success if it sends a credible signal that that transformation is underway. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Espinosa. And uh, I think that's uh, very clear uh, for us that uh, there is a lot on the table and we, are, we have to tackle many challenges at the same time. So thank you very much for uh, these uh, concluding words. And uh, thank you very much for also going into detail on this question. And, uh, I think as we are now uh, transitioning over to uh, the next um, mm -hmm. element of uh, this event, I would like to thank you again, uh, thank uh, the three uh, speakers, uh, keynote speakers, which we had and also introduce uh, our next uh, speaker. And we will have a fireside chat, a quite virtual fireside chat uh, together with our next uh, speaker. Uh, he is the director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. He is also co-chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Networks. Mr. Aroma Revi is with us now, and I'm very, very happy to see you again, Aroma, and uh, looking forward uh, towards talking to you now for a couple of minutes to get your perspective on a couple of aspects which we already talked about earlier today. Thanks, Are Daniel. You with Happy us, to be Arma. with you. Yes, very much so. Um, yeah, it's good to be with you this morning. It was nice to hear the earlier session. So as soon as you're ready to go, we're we're good to go from here. Thank you. So let's let's go ahead, and I'm uh, really 
looking forward uh, to talking to you uh, around a couple of things. Uh, so, uh, and uh, great to see you again, actually. So you heard a couple of remarks uh, by uh, our keynote speakers uh, around transport and the key priorities which lie ahead of us. And just to jumpstart into this, I uh, would be uh, would be very, very interested to hear what you uh, think are the key priorities over the next 12 months. Well, I think the most important thing is that we have to move to action. This has been a, you know, a, a more than a year now, which is a kind of a, almost a gap year as far as uh, international climate processes are concerned, partially because of COVID uh, and partially because of you know, some turbulence, I would say, in the international environment. But given what we heard starting in Anga about you know, some very large countries, including China, making the commitment uh, to, uh, you know, to go to net zero uh, by, by 2050. We're, we're seeing, you know, a positive uh, momentum just now. So I think building on that is quite, quite important. Uh, we're expecting to see some significant shifts in the U.S. position uh, early next year. And I think that will help us sort of bring us back on track as far as Paris is concerned, because you know, we have less than 10 years now, and 10 years is like, you know, about 4,000 odd days to de deliver on the, um, on, on the commitments for Paris. And we know from the 1.5 report that I helped kind of put together and write, you know, some of the critical chapters on, that we really have to mobilize this now. I mean, literally the next two or three years have to help us build the foundations after which we, we have to get on to the same exponential change process that we've seen, uh, you know, in terms of how emissions are, are running. Uh, so we, those, those foundations, we have probably less than two or three years to build it. And by the time the stock take is in place, these international frameworks, the engagement uh, with a whole range of actors across the world, whether it's uh, in the financial space or on the implementation space with local and regional governments have to be put in place. And I think there's a lot of work to be done. So building that consensus, making sure that uh, the turbulence and some of the rifts that, that have emerged uh, over the last few years have got to be addressed. And also addressing some of the elephants in the room, uh, questions to deal with adaptation, uh, which is seems to be apparently a little bit different from from you know a lot of the discussion about decarbonization of transport will be quite important, because remember the pivotal sort of elements of of these transformation that we'll see over the next few years uh, will come uh, in the cities of the global south, in in parts of Asia and Africa, uh, in some residual processes in 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 Latin America. So. Uh, getting that right is going to be really important. It's not easy. Uh, there's been a lot of commitment that's made, but we need to see concrete action on the ground and synergies between multiple sectors. Uh, so that's that's going to be, I'm hoping that in a sense COP26 COP will be that watershed moment where we see five years after Paris or so, uh, you know, the rubber hitting the road and, and seeing the beginning of, of structural shifts taking place. Uh, one crucial question which I would like to ask you is um, t t trying to transition from what we uh, are agreeing on at COP26 towards the actual action on the ground in cities around the world. We see a lot of uh, challenges also are institutional. So the capacity uh, is uh, not there to actually implement as, uh, as fast as we should. Uh, Ms. Espinosa also uh, mentioned uh, that in developing countries, a lot of the infrastructure is simply not there yet and will be built in the next couple of years. Uh, so we have to make sure that this is low carbon infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So how would you uh, see from your point of view, how would you see, can we tackle the institutional challenge of just having not enough capacity in many places to, 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 to bring action on the ground? I think we need to get a little bit of perspective on this, at least from my point of view, um, Local and regional local processes are at the forefront of, of what we're doing, de dealing with this now. Uh, much of what we see happening at COP is really the engagement. It's an intergovernmental en engagement apart from other actors that are there. So hopefully, like I said, we will see less turbulence in the intergovernmental system. Uh, so you know, if, if that happens, then the opportunity to engage with uh, challenges that are that are that are taking place within countries will then so hopefully take take precedence. And the reason I'm saying this is this is a partnership that has to be built, not only you know between the let's say 200 countries or whatever 193 that are involved in the process, but also within the countries themselves 
between a national, regional, and local government, especially in large federal uh, countries like in India or in Brazil or you know even in China for that matter, uh, you need to get the multiple sort of multiple layers in, engaged. So there's activity happening on the ground, but if it's not supported by policy, uh, by a, a whole range of other supports uh, at, at the national level, it will not have legs. So uh, I'm hoping that 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 sort of discussion will take place. Uh, and we're able to see some significant resourcing. So, for example, I mean, a simple sort of question. Uh, if we are able to get uh, infrastructure moving, let's say, for, for, for public transportation in, in many of the sort of rapidly growing or emerging uh, cities in the Global South and let's say Sub-Saharan Africa or let's say South Asia, where I come from, uh, it means uh, a significant change on both the supply side um, trying to see that you know electric vehicles, for example, and electrification becomes possible. And this cannot happen without the active involvement of national government, changes in policy, change in, in, in procurement, and the mobilization of enough, uh, let's say, demand so that manufacturers, for example, of, of buses, of electric buses, are able to actually, you know, uh, they, they have uh, foresight in terms of where they can make their investments. Now, the interesting opportunity we have, of course, is because of very large and in some cases pretty significant uh, sort of post-COVID recovery packages, uh, some of which are in the infrastructure space. Now, uh, in, in, some, in some parts of the world, there is a sort of directed policy orientation towards trying to make these not only uh, sort of jobs uh, and employment sort of friendly and sort of elastic on that side, but also to deal with questions of decarbonization and, and resilience. Uh, but that's not true everywhere. And I think this is one, one, one space in which we can really do a lot. So there is resourcing in place, but because it has to go out literally over the next uh, few months, or let's say over the next uh, uh, 24 months or so, uh, there's, there's so, so much of a rush uh, on delivery because you know countries are hurting, uh, hundreds of millions of people are, have, have lost their jobs. Uh, we are kind of losing sight of that. And that's where the question I think that you made of institutional capacity is, is a really critical one. And since the pivot of this entire transition uh, is not necessarily going to be in national governments on implementation, it's going to be in smaller places. It is in the intermediate towns uh, or the cities, let's say 100,000 to half a million, that uh, in a sense, the tipping points will be actually sort of, you know, will be, will be reached. Uh, and that's where we have the weakest capacity. Uh, that's where we have the weakest empowerment in terms of raising taxation, dealing with questions of planning, having the right kind of technical capacity, uh, having the resources that come from both domestic uh, and international financial systems to try and deal with that. So I would say uh, we need to sort of sequence this thing. Uh, we have to sort of pick up on what we have at the moment, show that the integration is possible in some places. And we've seen that happening with the larger urban networks. Uh, sort of I'm involved with a number of those conversations. But we have to prepare to build the capacities and move literally over the next two or three years, because you know it's only then that you can you can manage the multiple doublings that will take us anywhere near uh, you know 50% reduction uh, of emissions and resilience by by the end of the decade. So it has to be crafted carefully. It will be differential in different parts of the world because of the nature of governments, uh, you know the kind of institutional capacities on the private sector side, on the community side. And of course, uh, of leadership. So this is going to be a, a very interesting dance. But I think we should take some heart from COVID because what we've seen in COVID is the ability to rapidly change and turn direction uh, in the face of a, of a dramatic uh, local, regional, and global crisis. Thanks, Aruma. And I, I really liked uh, the bit where you talked about that uh, many smaller places, more, uh, smaller cities of 100,000 of up to 500,000 uh, inhabitants uh, do need uh, more capacity and do need uh, more uh, action to come on the ground. And um, I'd like to ask you, I'm an urban planner myself and uh, I, I believe you uh, have a very good urban planning background right. too. Uh, so I would like to ask you is, as urban planners always talk about that solutions have to be contextualized, you have to look at the local context for a solution. Uh, obviously, this is true, but in the situation we are, uh, and looking also at uh, many of these cities around the world, do you see potential that we can uh, bring together cities on 
uh, similar or same solutions uh, to basically bundle implementation and go ahead faster. Uh, I give you an example. So you would assume that uh, most of uh, the cities growing fast would need some sort of bus network, for example. So mm -hmm. would you think that this is something where you could pool resources? Absolutely. So, I mean, the thing is, this, of course, context is very important, both national, regional, and of course, local context, because every city is different. It's like almost like, you know, like, like a person in some senses, because of the context they live in. But there are some things that, that sort of cut across, uh, you know, pretty much most geographies. Obviously, because of the economic context, the ability of a city government or a national government to invest in a particular infrastructure may be kind of limited. But we have two things on our side. The first thing is, like we've just heard, and we know this, is that a lot of the infrastructure uh, that we're talking about, at least over this decade and maybe even over the next two decades, is yet to, yet to be built. So we have a huge opportunity there. If we're able to decarbonize you know, early enough, uh, we are going to reap the benefits of doing that. So there's a massive leapfrog potential as far as that's concerned. And we've seen that in other sectors. I mean, telecom is the most you know, obvious example that's there in which a leapfrog can actually find rapid deployment. Of course, as far as uh, you know, mobility infrastructures are concerned, both for freight and for people, uh, they have slightly longer life cycles, they're more lumpy, so you, you probably wouldn't see that kind of you know, rapid movement. But you know, given, given that, that you have a, you know, you've got a lot of space to, 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 to make that transition just now, I would say that um, you know, very simple things. We know from the energy transition point of view, that we have to electrify, right? Uh, and when we need to electrify, the question then is in the mobility systems, how do we move from a whole range of, let's say, liquid fuels, which are also a deep problem in many parts of the world. For example, in, you know, in, in Asia, uh, we have some of the worst air quality in the world and just on health grounds, I would say, uh, the convergence and, and, and the transition to uh, low carbon fuels would be a very good thing to do. So uh, one has to look at, at the process of decarbonization, both inside the transportation system. So let's say moving to electric vehicles, moving to you know, light rail and a whole range of other things that maybe that, that, use, uh, that use electricity, but also at the same time, trying to make sure that the grid that supplies you, uh, the, that, that energy is also clean because it's no use fixing a problem at this end and then having something at, at the end of the pipe creating a problem at that end. And, and, that, and this requires coordination between national, um, uh, local and regional governments to make that happen because if it's not in lockstep, then you know, all the effort you put at one end will not have a significant event. So that's one, one example. The second thing is, uh, you know, if you're going to be building these infrastructures, you're going to, to make these transitions of, you know, of, of mode, uh, you will require significant numbers of, of let's say, new vehicles. Uh, and I think that's the opportunity that we have where we can actually start lumping not only procurement at national level, of course, for large countries like India, it's a lot easier and you know you can you know, break it down take the top 100 cities and you have a very large sort of uh, potential demand that's there but across uh, other countries uh, the networks are already doing this but i think uh, there needs to be more con 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 conversation uh, for example some parts of southern africa or even uh, in west africa or east africa if we're able to lump together uh, procurement so that we're able to get the best technology in really quickly uh, set up the right uh, legal and regulatory frameworks so that you know price discovery uh, and the aggregation is not going to sort of uh, burden the, the burden the, the user because what, what very often happens in this rapid technical change is that the poorest people either get left out or they pay a price that they can't afford and you're going back to older modes of, of engagement so there's a policy element of it there's very critically a question of financing uh, at the local level and that means that there's an opportunity then to try and innovate in terms of local government financing. And, uh, you know, we all know this, but local governments really struggle across the world because their financial base is weak. Uh, they're disempowered in some senses. So we have to think out of the box in terms of trying to make that happen in terms of local taxation, in terms of various transfers that take place from other levels of government. And of course, if you're able to pool together um, financing opportunities, you can actually then uh, find larger players in the, in, in the inter international market, whether it's the Global Climate Fund or other uh, institutions, maybe even more, more towards the private side, who can, you know, the ticket size of, of the investments become significant enough that they can actually come in and, and deal with that. So there's a lot of innovation that needs to take place. I would suspect that some of this will actually happen uh, with the larger cities. So in that sense, the million plus cities 
uh, sort of the, the Johannesburgs, the Rios, um, or let's say the Mumbai's, et cetera, of the world will be important or Delhi's of the world will be important in that. Uh, but eventually our target really is to, to affect the tipping point in the small and medium towns uh, and the smaller cities, because they're going to grow. They, you know, some of them are doubling uh, every, every two decades or so. So if you, if you deal with them now at the scale in which you can deal with them, dealing with questions of, of land, of planning, uh, of the relationship between work and, um, uh, you know, and, and where people stay, uh, because it's not only a question of dealing with the mobility system itself, it's also what it serves that needs to change. Because you know, a lot of this is locked into the form of, of, of the urban fabric. And that's more difficult to, to change. And you know, that may take, I would say, in some cases, decades to shift. But we'll have to sort of phase it step by step, get the early wins first, show the value of integration uh, and the, you know, the potential of trying to uh, make the deep structural changes in institutional arrangements, which are going to be the hard bit. Thank you. And I think, um... As you describe it, we this is really a, a, a team effort. We not only have to be where the ball is right now, we do also have to have players playing where the ball is going to be. Um, so thank you very much, Aramar. I, I think I, I would have loved to continue this conversation for the whole day, but I believe that would bring the program out of tune with the agenda. But uh, uh, very, very, very much uh, talking to you briefly and uh, going through these questions uh, together with you. Thank you for having and, me. And I hope things go well. This is a very important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Aramar. And uh, now we are uh, getting over, coming over to a video message. And um, I would like to pass also the button uh, of uh, button of um, moderation to Mr. Sasank uh, Vimuri, who is uh, taking over in uh, minutes, but first of all, enjoyed a video message uh, from Minister Gloria Hutt, the Minister for Transportation and Telecommunications in Chile. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this session. This year, 2020, is a year of unique changes. During the pandemic, the public effort has focused to recovering the health of citizens. Simultaneously, the transport sector has faced significant challenges to provide safe journeys, allocate enough public space to mobility, reconfigure services, and install and maintain sanitary protocols that cover metropolitan areas as well as small towns. The demand has dropped dramatically, and it was necessary to change in very short term new payment models to ensure the continuity of public transport services. Freight and logistics have taken on unprecedented role, maintaining the supply chain active while protecting the health of drivers and port staff implied new procedures, strict protocols, and integrated work with health authorities. Shortly after the peak, when confinement restrictions were reduced and mobility started to grow again, we noticed the clear threat of massive car use. The perception of infection risk linked to mass transport still works as a strong motivation to prefer car at levels that weaken dramatically the share of public transport. Our main effort today is twofold. On one hand, we need to recover passengers in public transport modes. This requires recovering the trust of users on their health safety. Evidence is now available that confirms low levels of infection originated in shared vehicles, such as buses, trains, or aircraft. As far as the face mask is mandatory, vehicles are sanitized uh, daily and hand wash is a permanent recommendation. Not relaxing these conditions will help to keep the situation under control, at least in this field. Recent research shows that in Chile, for example, more than 73% of infected people got the virus in their family environment, where protection measures tend to be less strict. On the other hand, we have to keep the supply flows working without interruption. New shopping formats and the delivery of goods at household level are taking our attention to the logistics system, its efficiency, 
and protection. We are now working hard to anticipate the impact of these recent changes in, on the environment. We are also evaluating how the new scenarios affect the achievement of our public policy objectives towards clean air and improved quality of life. The threat of an increase in car use, for example, or the slow recovery of public transport users are bad news. They push us to immediate and additional actions, keeping our targets alive without significant modifications. The call during the last COP was clear. We need to increase our ambition. Increasing the ambition now implies responding to the current challenges without weakening the scope or timing of the original goals. We still have to keep in mind the Paris Agreement as our guide and reference. In that sense, we need to take advantage of the momentum and develop recovery plans that are both beneficial to the economy and to the climate. There are some proven solutions such as expanding the use of electric vehicles in mass transit or promoting active modes, to mention a few. However, implementing the initiatives and accelerated pace is not always straightforward. I was asked to summarize our recent experience with electromobility in the public transport system of Santiago de Chile. In spite of having a structured long-term strategy, the det details to advance soon and fast were missing. So we took the results of a small pilot test of three electric buses to evaluate the convenience of expanding the new technology and also improving the quality standard of the system. We also worked with the existing contracts and found a way to make them useful to support a major fleet renewal without any modification of the payment commitments, budget, or operational plans. The resulting model, which separated the strategic assets from operation, was attractive to investors. At the same time, electric bus manufacturers from China expanded their offer in the country, and they improved significantly the quality of their products. Energy distribution companies were also interested and they supported the financing of the first 100 buses and the electro depot, anticipating a new business area. This was the trigger that raised the enthusiasm of other consortia to do the same. The new buses delivered a significantly improved service. Users gave the best rating ever to the new system. It created a natural dynamic to incorporate more electric vehicles and also diesel Euro 6 in some routes to attract passengers and to avoid their preference for cars. From the government, we facilitated associations between these companies and adjusted the contracts to incorporate the new bus standard. By the end of year 2020, we will complete the renewal of one third of the existing fleet in Santiago de Chile. This means more than 2,200 buses out of 6,200 that are the complete fleet. This includes 750 electric buses. At the same time, we are now undergoing a bidding process for fleet supply that will allow the change of other 2,030 additional buses, diesel Euro 6 and also electric. We are very proud of this result because it opened a very clear method to change the bus fleet in Santiago within the existing framework. We are also advancing in other cities by bringing new high standard vehicles, integrating diesel Euro 6 and electric te technology in smaller units. Along with the electromobility, we brought high standards to our passengers. The new buses offer air conditioning, free Wi-Fi while you travel, USB chargers, for the cell phones, a LED lighting, universal accessibility, and a beautiful design. So we are making the public transport more attractive. On top of that, with zero emissions and no noise. This is a very concrete way of improving our cities and giving comfort to users. We have now abundant material to share regarding our experience. The process is not finished yet. We still have to complete the changing of the existing system to a new business model based on smaller units, shorter contracts, and the strategic assets controlled centrally, while the operation and payment system 
are delivered through private concessions. We can learn from each other to speed up innovation and implementation of good practice. The discussion over the next three days provide a most valuable opportunity to get insights and knowledge that will facilitate the process of decarbonizing transport. I hope you have a very productive session today and the following days. Thank you. And I make sure that all our experience, information, and references are available for the analysis of specialists. I also want to take this opportunity to announce that the Ministry of Transport and Telecommunications of Chile, as a part of Chile's UNFCCC COP presidency, will host a series of technical dialogues on raising climate ambition in the transport sector. These events will bring together representatives of ministries of transport and environment from the Latin American and Caribbean region in order to learn from each other and exchange our successful approaches, implementation strategies, and available tools for decarbonizing transport and seeking a green recovery. Thanks to the support of the German Ministry of Environment, BMU, and the assistance of GIC, the peer exchange dialogues will also be offered in Africa and Asia in 2021. The dialogue series will provide a platform for peer exchange and networking to support transport ministries to become more involved in the formulation and implementation of their country's Paris Agreement aligned, low carbon development strategies and recovery plans. To close, as a representative of the COP presidency, but also as a mother and grandmother, I ask you all to take whatever actions you can as citizens, experts, managers, and policy makers to size the unique opportunity presented by COVID to build forward better and put transport firmly on track for a safe, sustainable, low carbon recovery. Thank you very much and have a success. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sasan Kamuri. I think maybe my camera will turn on shortly. Um, as you can see, perhaps on the slide, uh, I'm the coordinator of the Mobilize Your City Partnership. Um, the Mobilize Your City Partnership was launched at the COP21 in Paris. And so five years on, we're also reflecting what's happened in the past five years. Um, and I'd like to first of all, thank the organizers for inviting me to moderate the session and also congratulate them on the diversity of different formats are being that they're using so far. I would encourage you to also use the question and answer feature on the, um, on the platform. To, to engage with us a little bit. And uh, we're going to have now a session with five really interesting panelists uh, to talk a little bit about how we've gone from the COP21 in Paris heading to, to Glasgow next year. Um, what are the lessons that we've learned? What are some challenges that are still facing us? Um, and maybe before I bring the panelists on, just a, a two minute reflection um, from me that, as I said, the Mobilize Your City Partnership was also launched at the COP21 in Paris. And um, we started with 15 partners uh, five years ago. Now we've grown to nearly hundred partners. We work with 60 cities and 14 national governments across the world um, to support them in preparing uh, comprehensive mobility plans and investment programs. And we've been able to mobilize 811 million euros in additional financing to enable access for 6 million people um, to improve more sustainable mobility. So this is um, in the morning session, we heard that you know without uh, policies at the national levels, engaging with the local levels, we won't have the traction that we need and that's exactly sort of the intersection that we work at. So um, without further ado, let me introduce the panelists that will help us kind of talk a little bit about what non-state actors can contribute to this process. So how do we ensure that the action um, is, is really happening? So we have, First, Ms. Um, Kaya uh, Axelson, as you can see from, so she's a part of the Net Zero Policy Engagement Fellow in the University of Oxford. Um, she uh, represents the youth. I'm really interested in also like, in her perspective on how we, uh, the conversation has changed in, in the last five years. Um, a second speaker we have is um, 
excuse me, uh, Adriana Mabandi. She's the director of Afro uh, STEM and also a lecturer at the Southeastern Kenya University. Um, at the panel, we also have Gavin Dunnett, head of the mobility department from the European Investment Bank, which is really now trying to be the global climate bank. So I'm really interested in hearing that perspective as well. We heard a lot this morning about the importance financing has to play. Um, we have Christian Haas, who is the CEO of the PTV group on the panel um, to kind of suggest a little bit what the private sector is thinking about. And also Sheila Watson. Um, so we are on the um, America's Partnership Global Climate Action Working Group sometimes together. And I know that she always has very interesting, provocative thoughts. So um, this is our panelists. I will give them a couple of minutes with just um, an opening uh, question to maybe get the conversation started. And hopefully we can have about 40 minutes, 45 minutes of an interactive, interesting conversation. So again, don't hesitate to, and please use the question and answer function. If you would like to ask some questions, um, don't forget to engage with us on social media. Um, so hashtag on route to COP26. Um, so with uh, so let me start with uh, with Kaya. Hi Kaya. Um, Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm doing <laughs> um, very well. It's very sunny in this part of London. Is it? Oh, that's great. So in Brussels, it's not sunny at all. I think <laughs> I probably need five more lights. Um, so I. You know, you're, you're working also closely with the high level champions. You were part of the youth fellowship to the race to zero campaign. I mean, if it were not for COVID, I would think that Fridays for Future were sort of like the big thing that happened in the last five years to kind of influence this conversation. Obviously it's been overshadowed a little bit, but can you tell me about, about your perspective? Like how um, has uh, the situation changed since the past five years? What do you think is important from a youth perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm I'm one of those older youth now um, who is taking the cue <laughs> from from the younger youth. Um, I finished my master's at the University of Oxford last year, um, and in that process, I remember feeling um, like I wish I was born, you know, <laughs> ten years earlier. Because watching the the euphoria and the righteousness of the Fridays for Future movement as they streamed down the street, um, as kind of the the older college students around us were sort of wondering, you know, what should we do? How should we help? Um, and and it really was that moment when when we saw the young people um, of the town come out that we decided we had to get our act together and, and build a climate action plan in Oxford. And I think that that kind of, that that is what is happening all over the world. We're seeing young people take to the street and, and go to their older peers and say, what are you doing? Um, mm. And we saw that with the recent U.S. election. Um, Fridays for Future is one of, of many movement organizations that young people have have an option if they want to go organize now um, and be together in, in the truth of what is happening to our planet. Um, the, the Sunrise Movement is an, another example and which realized that, that young people have to take charge from an electoral perspective. They used a tactic called a, appeal to mass media, a timed appeal to mass media where they would find candidates um, at a moment where the press was available and the press is available kind of at all times if you have an iPhone, which with <laughs> when, when I was in high school was not the case. Um, and, and what they're doing is that they're asking the tough questions and they're asking really informed questions. Um, they're not interested in, in whether a, a climate candidate cares about, about climate change. They wanna know how many trillions of dollars they're gonna put into their climate action plan. And that was how mm. we saw the, that shift in the kind of US, especially the primary cycle. Um, it was no longer okay to, to simply mention climate change. You had to have a, a really strong plan. And, and now That's we're great. seeing strong in office with that plan. Thank you. I think, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned it's also this conversation about ambition to action is not just a slogan that's being used in these conversations, but it's also something that's really being demanded by the youth. I mean, that also shows how um, informed uh, and uh, able the, the conversation has been from, from the youth. Um, so maybe, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll turn the conversation to, to Adriana um, from uh, the, uh, who's also lectured at the Eastern uh, Kenya University. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about how, you know, um, in addition to kind of what the civil society is doing, the youth movement, what is, uh, from the academic perspective, the role of energy, technology, transport, 
um, how do these different streams come together? What is the research field doing? And then also maybe about um, the developing economies in the global south. What are the particular challenges that they face? Um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, greetings from Nairobi. Uh, my name is Andriana Bandi. I am actually at Afri STEM Connection. It is a company that uh, I started alongside with another engineer that looks at increasing STEM awareness, STEM being science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, so increasing STEM awareness and sustainability in underserved communities uh, using emerging technologies. And so that combines my passion for engineering, education, and also entrepreneurship. So to answer you, I, I think there's a lot happening already, but I think when I look at, um, I, I look at sustainable transport and mobility, I think of that in terms of, of, of three, uh, three things really. When I think of that, I think of uh, energy as an engine to economy. And I ask, um, in sustaining livelihoods and uh, driving, the sector, uh, driving the sectors, including transport in Africa, the energy agenda is quite important. We are rich in renewable, uh, we are, we are rich in reno renewable energies, um, but there's a conundrum of energy poverty. So when we talk about el electricity access and we start talking about, I just caught the tail end of some of the uh, presentations talking about um, el uh, electric uh, vehicles, but thinking of that in terms of energy poverty and energy access. And also when you think about post, uh, post COVID recovery, I've been in various meetings where people are talk, uh, talking about um, recovery in terms of mobility, but also energy access. But at the same time, you have uh, governments taking action where they're increasing taxations for uh, cleaner energy. So things uh, that like en clean energy uh, for, for cooking access, uh, where people are indoors and using dirty fuels, but also living close to road size, being exposed to uh, emissions. So there's that conundrum as well. So I put it to you, as we are talking about post-COVID recovery and talking about vaccinations, vaccines being available for communities perhaps, I want to ask you what kind of uh, transport is going to transport those vaccines to those villages? Is it going to be clean transport or is it mm. going to be air polluting transportation? Uh, is it going to be refrigerated trucks that are using dirty energy that are going to um, increase air pollution, which has been shown to increase COVID mortalities? So mm. I say to you that energy access, but also at the same time, looking at innovations that we're talking about youth and talking about technologies, innovation of technologies, the rapidness in which we are developing these vaccines. But I put it to you that developing economies are also one of the fast adapters for technologies, use of cell phones and mobile uh, banking. I put it to you, for example, if somebody wants to buy something from the market, they can easily use your, their telephone to call and get it delivered by a motorcycle and the transaction paid on the phone. That is somewhere in the, some remote, remote part of Africa. So the infrastructure where that we have currently have cannot be the one that mm. takes us forward where we have unsafe roads and dirty vehicles. It has to be clean vehicles and, 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 and safe roads. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, I, I think you, you brought up this, um, this question about the intersectionality of all of these different complex issues, right? So it's, um, I mean, you mentioned energy poverty, but there's also transport poverty, right? I mean, so there's also the question of access. Um, we talk about zero emission vehicles, but if we have 35, 40, 50% of people in, in urban areas walking uh, as the majority of their trip is happening by foot, then what purpose does the zero emissions vehicle play? And how do we bring all of these uh, issues together um, in a way that effectively uses the limited resources that we have? Um, so I don't know, Gavin, if that's um, a big task, but I wonder, you know, as the EIB is becoming a climate bank, how you think about uh, with, I mean, as much finances and resources as you have, it's still kind of a drop in the bucket. Like, how do you think about leveraging development finance to address kind of these multiple challenges related to energy, technology, transport, access? I can't hear you. I think maybe you're on mute. I'm sorry. Somebody told me that uh, you're on mute has become the word of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> Zoom. In my case. <laughs> well, thank you and good morning. Good morning and morning to everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation to, to join this uh, interesting discussion. So, Sank, I mean, you, you mentioned resources, uh, financial resources as much as anything else will be a key to, to this transition. Um, and uh, we at the European Investment Bank, uh, we, we've been sort of um, gradually moving towards becoming the EU uh, climate bank 
for a number of years in 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 a couple of phases. So, uh, you know, initially we had always, in fact, uh, prioritised more sustainable modes of transport, and and for many years um, we were pumping six billion euros a year uh, into sustainable transport. Um, of course, that all changed in terms of emphasis uh, with with Paris uh, and the European mm. sort of. Um, um, push for Paris. The bank then has converted itself and declared itself to be the EU's climate bank and made some fairly major commitments in terms of resources. So um, we're looking at a trillion euros of investment over the next 10 years and increasing the, the proportion of uh, finance that we we put into sustainable transport to 50% of everything that the bank does. And, and uh, of course, the other 50% still has to be Paris aligned as, as well. So not everything is, is climate, but everything has to be Paris aligned. Um, uh, last month, in fact, we, we made that more concrete by approving uh, in a very public way the, the uh, Climate Bank roadmap for the European Investment Bank, which has some real consequences um, in terms of what we prioritize uh, in, in investments. And the next phase for that, particularly in the transport sector, from our point of view, is convert that into a new transport lending policy, which will mm. uh, which will incorporate all of the aims of the European Green Green Deal and 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 the Paris Accord, of course, focusing more on greener and cleaner, uh, safer and secure, innovative and efficient, uh, inclusive and accessible. You mentioned uh, accessibility; poverty is a real issue as well. I mean, much of what we do, the majority of what we do is in Europe, and there are still developing parts of Europe as well. But we also play a big, uh, a big part in rolling out the European Union's uh, objectives in development, uh, according to the various mandates that, that, that we've given. And, um, you know, we, we plan to, um, to, to take the message of um, sustainable transport and, and, and the climate sustainability into everything that we do in, in the near future. Great, thank you. Um, the, the future um, is digital. And I think that would also really, and some of these, these challenges that we're talking about um, can really be served well, maybe perhaps some, some digital solutions. So maybe we can bring Christian Haas, uh, CEO of the PTV Group into, into this conversation and um, and I'd like to know a little bit about, you know, just your thoughts on when we're looking at mobility and transport in cities. So of course, financing is a really big issue. Um, but what are the other steps that we need in place to have um, the transformation that we need uh, to get to, to zero, to get on the road to zero? Thanks very much, Isaac. And, you know, Gavin just mentioned uh, financial resources are, uh, are key, and uh, I agree to that. But at the same time, I think technology will be key as well, and you just mentioned it. Um, let me just add uh, before that um, the minister from Chile was just talking about what happens in Santiago, and I think uh, Santiago actually is a role model with uh, the e-bus fleet uh, they've been setting up, etc. And uh, I think that's clearly the way to go. And uh, she also said that we have to use momentum, and I think that's also going to be key. But, let me come, come back to your question. Uh, unfortunately, um, 2020 only knew uh, or knows uh, one big topic, and that's the uh, mm -hmm. pandemic. And uh, Andreana has been mentioning it uh, before as well. And the, that pandemic has been affecting all our daily lives, I think, massively for most of the year now. But uh, there was one positive impact, I would say, and that was that it has demonstrated how livable cities can be with less traffic. And uh, during the first lockdown in April this year, rush hour traffic jams vanished in, in many metropoles around the world and people switched to bicycles. Uh, I think that was a great phenomenon to see. And from Bogota to Berlin, everywhere pop-up bike lanes were, were built with the final result that uh, air quality and uh, less noise in the cities appeared. And in Madrid, for example, the average NO2 levels went down by 56% from one week to the next at the end of March, and according to the European Environment Agency. And in Rome, for example, the average NO2 concentrations during the lockdown were 26 to 35% lower than in the same period in 2019. And I think that's quite telling, to be honest. 
I think cities now have to gain momentum and uh, size exactly that opportunity. They need to think about how they can use these effects in the long term to set a new course in terms of mobility and also the reallocation of urban space. And for me, personally, the most important factor is to always act citizen-centric. And uh, that means that cities must create livable environments for their citizens, and they have to consider their needs and their expectations. Uh, if we want, for example, that people use other modes of transport than their own car, and that's what we've seen during the pandemic as well, we need to offer a mobility service that enables them to be productive and to multitask during their journeys so mm -hmm. they can travel whenever they want. But it also means that we must urgently discuss how we can raise the attractiveness and reliability of public transport again that has been suffering quite a lot during uh, the, the lockdowns. Um, um, uh, yeah, sorry. No, sorry. I, I, um... Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I think you've raised a lot of really interesting points. I'm also really curious to come back to the some of the points you raised and particularly about how technology can help serve some of these issues. But if you don't mind, I wanted to bring Sheila in. I mean, especially when you mentioned citizen centric. Um, I mean, that was uh, kind of an interesting keyword that I thought maybe that Sheila could pick up on. And then maybe Sheila, I could also ask you to to kind of come maybe just take one step back and think about this, um, the road from COP21 to Glasgow. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, how, what, I mean, what you've seen as some of the big developments and have you delivered on your commitments and what you think the new changes are? I mean, and, and yeah, um, but uh, Christian, sorry for the, the interruption. <laughs> we'll come back to some of those really interesting topics. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for that introduction, Sasank. And um, it's a great honor to be here today. So thank you for having me. Um, there are many different dimensions to the issue of how we bring citizens into this. And, 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 and one of those issues is, is how we make sure that those who are not included properly at the moment uh, mm -hmm. and considered properly within our planning of transport are uh, considered in the future. And, and there are many groups like that, uh, gender-based issues, women such as myself, our travel patterns are not properly accounted for. Uh, and the ultimate impact of that is not just that it's very unfair that transport systems don't work well for us, but because women use shared mobility so much more than men, it actually undermines our whole sustainable mobility plan. Because if we don't get from our transport systems what we want, uh, we don't advise our children to use them. And, and that sort of beneficial cycle of use that we need going forward can be broken. And it's not surprising that it happens. It happens because uh, we, we conducted a survey on this or supported a survey on this just recently, that there isn't any data collected. So we always get down to those very basic and mundane points, but they're important. If you don't count things, you can't change them. Uh, and uh, women's perspectives uh, are, are just not really taken into account. And I can say some more about that later. But going to your point about COP21, and where things have gone since then, uh, we at the FAA Foundation support an initiative called um, GFEI, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative. And in Paris in, 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 in 2015, we made a pledge as an initiative to move our support, which at that point was around 40 uh, countries, uh, into uh, 100 countries. Uh, and over the time since then, we've been uh, able to support countries such as Argentina and Uruguay as they develop fuel economy labeling. We've been able to support Mozambique and Mauritius, uh, Belize and Togo and our, our work with regional organizations such as the uh, ASEAN region, ECOWAS, G20 means that we've um, brought on board many, many more countries since then. And so mm. ultimately, we are delighted to be able to say that by Glasgow, we will be working in the 100 countries that we pledge to support. And, and, and I think the key about that is that this is work which seeks to promote efficient vehicles, uh, but it's essential that those changes and those developments, those policy frameworks include electrification, set long-term plans uh, and give countries support. We mustn't lecture, we must support and capacity mm. is a massively important piece of the jigsaw. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think this um, the the support is a really interesting um, topic, and also the lack of data is a really big issue, right? And we, I mean, we see that really in in mobilize your cities work. 
but also the flip side of it is by collecting the data, we're revealing also some really interesting things that maybe we didn't think about five years ago. So, I mean, just from the Mobilize Your Cities perspective, for example, we realized the importance of having to work with the informal paratransit service providers when we want to decarbonize transport emissions. So sometimes 80% of urban emissions in some of our partner cities come from paratransit informal transport service providers of whose vehicles are 20 years, you know, and so some of them are 20 years old. So electric vehicles might not be necessarily accessible for people who can only afford vehicles that are 20 years old. So that's something that we're learning five years on. Can I ask some of you to also reflect a little bit about what do you know now that you didn't know five years ago that you're trying to bring into the conversation heading into Glasgow? I mean, the fact that 50% of EIB's lending has to both be climate compliant, Paris compliant and climate friendly. I mean, that's something we didn't have five years ago. Um, maybe, I don't know, Kaya, you, uh, being an older youth, can I also start with you again? Like, what do you know now, or what do you think we know now as a community that we didn't know five years ago, heading into Glasgow? I think that we know now that we are empowered to take the kind of bold action that would facilitate a transition away from combustion engine vehicles. And that was one thing that the youth dialogues made very, very clear. Um, you know, we had a, a really wonderful representative from um, from Daimler, from Mercedes Benz, and she and and she said, you know, we're we're setting a target to be um, carbon neutral by by 2039. And the youth said, well, I, I think government is going to catch up with you there. Why don't you know, why don't you lead a little further and um, and, and I think that we also know that um, we have to invest much more at the present. Um, we, we know that we've been sort of um, relying on faulty discount rates and, I, and we have to invest much more now because the payoffs are going to be so much greater. I mean, if you think about um, sustainable air fuel, that was one thing we had a young engineer from South Africa on saying, we have the resources here and now in Africa and he was speaking to a representative from BP and Shell at our, and he said, bring the sustainable air fuel development that you're doing elsewhere to Africa. We, we have the appetite, we have the talent. Um, and so I think that there are, there are probably the main takeaway is that five years ago, there was a lot more hesitation in the market mm. for, for upfront investment on the, on the solutions that we need. And people are starting to finally lose that hesitation, realizing that the returns and the fact that we need to internalize the externalities of, of the climate crisis mean that we should readjust how we're taking risk and thinking about risk. Mm, that's great. I mean, the, I mean, you started off by saying we are empowered. Um, so it kind of gets a bit tedious being on these Zoom meetings, but that's such a great statement to hear from somebody in <laughs> December on a Zoom meeting about uh, the, the, you know, this massive task that's ahead of us. Uh, but then you also talked about some really kind of nitty gritty things, discount rates, internalizing the external costs of climate impacts. Can I just pivot a little bit to Gavin and ask like, when EIB is trying to become a climate bank, how are you thinking about these external costs? What does it mean to be Paris compliant as opposed to doing a climate project? Like how, you said there's some serious implications to your new roadmap. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how, what the implications are? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, ob obviously, all of these things roll downhill in terms of uh, complexity. Um, you asked you asked the question, what do we know now? I mean, clearly, mm. one of the things we know we know now is that the transport sector is the biggest problem as far as decarbonisation is concerned. It's the sector which is continuing to grow despite everything that's happened in in the last five years. Um, and we also know that it's not an easy challenge. This is a multi-dimensional challenge, both from the technology point of view and from the societal point of view. We can't simply stop traveling. This is another thing that we know. Um, there have been some dramatic short-term changes in travel patterns, but actually the main global supply chains have remained open and need to remain open if society is continued going to continue to grow and, and, and develop. So th these are really, really big challenges. How do we, uh, how do we go about uh, supporting that change? It will be a gradual change, whether it's you know, what, what pace that change takes place at um, depends on a number of factors. Technology certainly is one of them. Available finance is another. I mean, the truth is that actually we're not investing enough in our transport networks at the moment, even to sustain the status quo, no, never mind mm. to transform uh, the entire sector. 
how do we how do we do that? Yes, it, it does cascade down to the sorts of things that we will we will and will not support, and and that has been laid out um, much more clearly in our climate bank roadmap, and that in turn um, makes its way down to the level of our investment analysis tools, uh, discount rates, price of carbon. All of these things must be consistent with uh, a carbon-free future. It will make it more difficult to support certain things, and that's the whole that's the whole idea, of course, is to encourage this transition. We we are not creating these projects. We are not introducing new technology. We are financing things which are put forward as part of the real economy, and we can influence and we can prioritize. Um, but if these projects are not there, if these projects are not being prioritized by national governments, uh, if the necessary financial flows are not going into these projects, then they will not they will not appear and then it's not possible to prioritize them. So these are a few of the things that I think we have been learning in the last few years. Mm, thank you. Um, Adrian, I was thinking, I mean, um, so Gavin talked about I, so. The, to say the transport sector is the biggest problem and that's one of the main things that we've learned in the past five years so it's one of the sectors that's really that's really growing i think to, that it's so squarely now front and center is a, a huge shift but how do you prioritize um transport projects and maybe particularly in africa but if you can you know talk also from other perspectives so we work as mobilized city in the, in the global south and when you've got all of these competing issues so you've mentioned energy access health education um, and of course, transport continues to be the greatest emissions, but, um, but uh, Andriana, can you reflect with me a little bit on how you think um, we can support cities and countries in prioritizing emissions? What is the expense of that? How has the conversation been, um, yeah, uh, when you're working with, with young women on STEM issues? Like, do they see uh, how climate compromises or support some of these other social dimensions? Thank you very much. I have just uh, been attending um, an engineering conference where we had over 2000 engineers uh, attending. It was a blended conference, both in person and virtually. And um, it was almost a step back to my engineering roots because I've been working mm. a lot more with environment and air quality. And I um, gave a talk about air pollution and COVID-19. I was asked to give a talk on a women in engineering perspective on post-COVID recovery. Um, I was the first one to talk about anything um, air pollution related or environment related really for that session. And uh, when I asked the engineers, uh, you know, does anyone know what aerosol engineering is? Uh, nobody knew it. So these are sort of the emerging fields that we're looking at going forward in terms of creating awareness, but also job, uh, uh, creating jobs is always a big question mm -hmm. when you talk to African governments. Um, informal sector paratransits employs a big uh, chunk of developing economies. Um, they transport millions uh, daily. So in terms of in incorporating them, integrating them in these plans as you're going forward is not only important for the environment, but it is critical for uh, sustaining livelihoods. But um, going back a little bit, uh, when you asked about what we didn't know five years ago, I thought again about um, citizen action because you also mentioned mm. it and Kaya did as well. I, will, I want to tell you about a tree in Nairobi that has gained uh, an iconic tree that has gained some uh, uh, fame including recently it was in the New York Times. This tree is uh, a, a few decades old. It's in the middle of Nairobi and it was going to be cut down as they expand in the roads. Um, mm. They're going to cut down this tree and there was an engagement citizen, very strong citizen engagement that said, you cannot cut down this iconic tree. They, they, they wrote letters, they demonstrated, uh, they made phone calls and the tree has been saved. But this is also connecting now to the notion of creating more awareness. People are more aware, they're taking action, they're demanding change, but it is also connected to non-motorized transport where the road is not just for cars. So in expanding the roads, you're only thinking about cars, but these roads are also for non-motorized transport users, for all road users. So in mm. terms of big infrastructure and financing, this is a, this is a big infrastructure finance, financed project that uh, might have had some of these considerations initially. But what went wrong? 
because uh, mm. in expanding the road in creating this, why were they willing to cut more trees? And there are more trees still dis designated for cutting down. Citizens are still uh, taking action. So that relates a sort of a, a wide array of things of how we consider infrastructure projects. But I think I've always been curious and say, and say that I want to see the checklist that, uh, you know, for, for example, banks uh, go through to see how they finance this project and just speak to reducing emissions, better air quality, better equality and, 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 uh, and uh, access. Uh, would be key factors and indicators to how you're going to finance these projects. Thank you, Sasank. Mm, thank you. Um, the, so the banks make this list public, so you can probably find them and I can share them with you as well. <laughs> um, but I also like that you said um, citizen action seems to be something we know that it's impactful. No, I mean, there's a greater sense now uh, through social media. I also heard about this tree in, in Nairobi. Um, and uh, I mean, that's... Um, I'm quite happy to see that surprisingly positive message about feeling empowered, that citizen action matters, that banks are shifting how they're doing business. I mean, this sounds all really positive. Um, I don't want to be the one that uh, brings in maybe a bit of reality check. Sheila, can you help me with that? <laughs> What's, uh, what do you think is still a little bit left uh, to do? Are we really sort of on the right path? Is everything going splendidly? Uh, we've got empowered citizens, uh, reformed banks, the financing that we need. What's what's left to be done, Sheila? Well, thank you. Thank you for giving me the fun job. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we haven't even added that we've got Joe Biden as well. So uh, <laughs> we have that positivity also to reflect upon. And we do. I think we really do. But we, you know, just because they're back in the tent and everyone certainly in relation to things like moving forward with new types of um, vehicles is terribly excited by, let's for, say, for example, the growth in sales of EVs. We mustn't forget that there is still um, a, a scaffolding of support that is needed. We do still need mm. those long-term decarbonisation plans. We need to build in the regulations that will bring the change at a pace that um, is going to get us anywhere near those targets. We need to get out of those vehicles and we need to employ active uh, and, and uh, mobility. Uh, and, and we need to do that for several reasons, one of which is for our health. And I think this is another key point. I mean, reflecting back to Paris, which seemed like a magical moment to me for the transport sector, you know, we were, we were very united as a group and we were sharing each other's messages and we were explaining the various relationships and co-benefits. We were giving politicians ways of seeing the picture uh, which included priorities and things to do first, which is incredibly helpful from their perspective. So I think standing together as a sector is important, but as I say, also linking to other key sectors is vital too. So health, um, mm. there's a session later this week, which I encourage you all to sign up to. In, in, in that session, we'll talk a lot about how uh, COVID has taught us a great deal, I think, Adriana, you said this as well about, about the links between active mobility and our health, for example. Also, energy, another crucial sector. So if we can, and we did some work recently with renewables and uh, on renewables for 2021, again, another report you can find on our website, which said, you know, without decarbonisation of energy, you don't get the gains on EVs. But unless you and the transport sector are pushing for the EVs, we're slowed down on the decarbonisation of energy. So I would say we should be positive, we should be joyful, uh, but we should plan um, on being clever as well. And now we've learned so much about what works. Another piece of work that we do is, is exposing the real on-road emissions of vehicles, the true initiative that uses the market to make change. It flushes out the dirty vehicles and alongside policies like low emission zones can make the difference in people's consumption choices. So use the market, use information, use data, form alliances um, and bring that energy into our own sector where we work for each other's objectives. So kind of all the tools, all the troops working together, I think, um, so that we can kind of turn that righteous anger, that amazing positivity, that place mm. we now have that Kaya mentioned, we have the permission and the, the desire of people to see change, but turn that into real momentum um, towards changing Glasgow, I think. Good, thank you. I, so you didn't, um, 
you didn't do a dreary job of <laughs> being in Rio. I think <laughs> I'm, um, I'm always reading these reports about, you know, like the how much people are spending on transport, low quality transport in the cities that we work in, the kind of emissions that they have, the air pollution that they're suffering from. And so maybe sometimes I'm a little bit in dark spaces. I'm really enjoying the session, at least um, for myself. But um, but can I bring in Christian? So. Um, Sheila mentioned a couple of really important points about using the market, about data. Um, can you uh, reflect a little bit on the, the data needs, like how we can use technology to gather this data that, that would be uh, that's kind of essential for this scaffolding of support that Sheila mentioned? Absolutely. And uh, so then, you know, coming back to one of the original questions you asked, what do we know more? I think... Yes, yeah. Uh, than five years ago, and I think that has also something to do with data, because generally, you know, we have so much more data now than we had five years ago in, in all the areas in regards to transportation, in regards to air quality, sustainability, uh, etc. And uh, I think we just have to learn how to make use of it best. And in order to do that, I think that requires a much stronger cooperation between the private sector, but also between the private sector and specifically the public sector. And without that, um, we won't be able to make it happen, just simply because there's so many different stakeholders. You know, uh, I think Andrea at the beginning was talking about how to get the vaccines in the cleanest way possible, et cetera, uh, to the places where they belong. Um, and, you know, only within that process that transportation companies, uh, the cities, uh, industry, there's so many stakeholders involved in this. They don't work closer with each other in order to uh, fulfill that common target. Um, we won't be successful. So uh, technology uh, is there. Uh, data is there, we just need to be able uh, to use it effectively and uh, obviously technology can help with that a lot. Um, cities, governments need to support that process around data. You know, there needs to be a clever and a secure way how to deal with that. Um, and then again, the cooperation between all these different stakeholders will be key. And then I think we're fine. <laughs> That's great. Um, so maybe I can uh, plug a couple of things. I mean, not in Mobilizer City, but the Sum for All initiative. Uh, so one of the working streams is on data, and uh, fairly soon we'll be releasing uh, as a as a consortia policy paper on uh, the kinds of policy implementation or policy measures that cities and national governments can take to facilitate this this data exchange. Um, so I think that's that's really interesting. Um, the, and then we have a, a session um, later this week also on the scaffolding of supports. So we're trying to, at least for urban uh, mobility, the national and, um, and local level, I think session seven, to, um, to think about what tools and resources are available already, um, what's been developed over the past five years to, to help um, put us on this path uh, to Glasgow. Um, great. Um, I... I'm just thinking is, uh, I mean, does anybody want like, did something, did you hear something that you want to reflect on or talk about from what some of the other people have said? Adriana, Kaya. Um. Well, I just wanted I to comment on your point and just say that, um, yes, we do have quite a long way to go. When, when I said we're empowered to ask the hard questions, you know, these are hard questions that should have been asked 10 years ago. And when we were putting together our, our youth dialogues, we were picking out leaders and we still had to push them. And, you know, there, there was a couple, a spattering of people with net zero targets in each of the hard to debate sectors that we could choose from. And even those net zero targets have a lot of questions. Um, but, but I think that, yeah, my, my point is more so that those questions are now seen as reasonable, critical and imminent and responsible. Whereas I think five years ago, they might have been seen as activist questions. And that's the shift I'm noting. Yeah, no, that's great. Somebody, I think somebody else, I, I didn't hear, was it Gavin? Did you want to say something or was it? Um, Sheila, may I? Or Chris. Yes, sure. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we shouldn't um, miss the really important point that I think Glasgow is going to offer us with the UK government, which is this mm. commitment to the end of the internal combustion engine. It's, it's, I think, both totemic and potentially transformational. That is only, of course, if it turns into something real, multinational, multi-party, proper plan, 
proper support around it. I discussed that earlier, uh, timeline resources and so on. But I do think that is the sort of commitment we have been waiting a very long time to see. Um, and if that can turn into real action in Glasgow, and I think we should all be working to support it, then that could be a genuinely impactful moment. And we will actually talk about that a little more in another session later this week, session nine, uh, where we'll examine how realistic it is and what needs to happen to support it. But I think um, that's a real, reason to be positive. Okay, that's great. Um, so we've only got a couple more minutes. Um, and the, I mean, the conversation has been really interesting. I don't want to um, take away time from you, but I'm wondering there's so um, this in the plenary session, somebody said we need to send a credible signal that transformation is on the way. So we're not talking about ambition, intention anymore, but really like we should be well on the way to transformation. Um, do you think we're doing that? I mean, are we sending a credible signal that transformation is on the way? Um, Gavin, uh, do you, or, sorry, Christian. Um, uh, so maybe either, either that question or what is one thing that you think we, you, from your perspective, would like to see happen before uh, COP26 in Glasgow? Well, you know, coming back to, you know, to your first question, uh, should we be sending something? I should, yeah, of course, yes. But I think it's also, you know, coming back to the citizen centric and the citizens themselves, I think the citizens are sending signals too. And I think we are right in the middle of that transformation already. But um, I think, you know, coming back to the statement from the minister in, in, uh, of Chile, in the recent session when she said we must use the momentum and you know i i phrase that a bit different uh you know and i'd say we have to really act now and there are plenty of discussions and i i think that's all great and probably that's because i'm from the industry and not from a, a, a politician but i think we really have to take action now i think we really know very well uh, what we have to do we have more information available than ever. We have fantastic data analytics tool. We can visualize data. We can make it more easy for policy makers, etc. But we have to take action now. And I think that's more important than anything else. Okay. Can I just um, pick the, so when you say we have to take action, are you taking action? So the signals yeah, are coming from the community. Absolutely, 100%. You know, we are, we are working with more than two and a half thousand cities globally. Very closely on that, we're talking with governments uh, around the globe, and uh, we want to play a very proactive role in supporting that movement. Great, thank you. Gavin, um, so closing remarks, are, you, are we sending the right signals? Um, what's one more thing you'd like to see? Choose your... Yes, thanks, uh, Sir Sank. Well, not, uh, you know, obviously, uh, as the European Investment Bank, we, we feel we are uh, now sending a very strong signal about what our priorities are going forward as the uh, EU's climate bank. Um, but I also agree that the process has already begun. So we, we need to keep signaling, but we also mm -hmm. need to join in the process. And, and that process uh, is, is long and difficult and multidimensional. Many of the, the issues have been mentioned already. The energy sector, you know, we have to we have to think about what this means for energy. Um, I read somewhere that uh, if all if all transport were to convert tomorrow to um, to electric, uh, we'd have a 30, 40 percent increase in global demand for um, um, for electricity. And and the renewables can't cope with that as things currently stand. So this is not mm. a you know this is not an overnight uh, solution. We've been talked a lot about urban areas. Clearly. Urban is important. Um, you're, you're all urban planners by the sounds of it. That's where most people live. It's where most investment takes place. Let's not forget that transport is a global network. And there are global issues to deal with in terms of shipping and aviation, which uh, you know, where it really is difficult to, to solve um, on a multinational basis. Um, there's a lack of investment. I mean, we you know we talk about investment. As if it's uh, as if it's just going to arrive. Uh, investment is going to be really, really difficult in the coming years. There is a global recession that's been initiated by this pandemic. Um, there will be many, many priorities for for money. And one of the dangers for the momentum for this uh, movement in transport is that the money will simply be diverted elsewhere. This is a huge, huge challenge. Mm. We mentioned citizen involvement, and this has been a you know a very positive aspect of of transport investment for many 
for many years now, but, but don't forget that the citizen involvement goes the other way as well. And uh, as soon as we start to say to people that they must pay more for their transport, mm. then we will see a different kind of citizen engagement, the sort of citizen engagement that we saw in France uh, for fuel tax rises, for example. So people are also very sensitive about the cost of transport, uh, whether they pay it or whether the government pays it, whether society pays it, the costs still have to be paid. So there are many, many challenges, but I think we are on a process. And, and as far as we're concerned at the European Investment Bank, we feel we're sending a strong signal about what our priorities are. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I think, unfortunately, we have to, to leave the conversation there, but this is just the first day um, of the, what was a one-day event, now a multi-day event. And I think um, you all gave us really interesting, insightful um, information and things to discuss. I mean, it really sounds like there's a sense of empowerment from, from communities, that there's a lot of data being collected, but the potential is not quite entirely being tapped. There's a shift in how finance, um, so banks, investors are thinking about their commitments to, to climate actions. Um, and there's generally, I mean, I liked the, um, the word that Sheila used as we should be joyful. I mean, there's, there's optimism. And so there's definitely a lot of work to do, but I think it's easier to take on this work um, from a, a, a joyful perspective. So thank you all very much um, for this conversation. Um, and really thank you also for the organizers for enabling such a, um, like an interesting panel and a, a, a diversity of, of formats. And with that, I will pass over to, uh, to Marisha from, from SLOWCAT uh, to take us into the next session. Well, thank you so very much, Sasank. What a terrific job you've just done moderating that panel, and what an exciting and inspirational set of remarks that we've uh, we've heard. Really, it's been it's been really inspirational. Thank you so very much for that. So we are heading now, indeed, towards the uh, um, concluding segment of this opening session. And of course, we couldn't do an opening session without tackling heads on the notion of how do we scale up. I was really impressed to hear a series of uh, of comments in the previous panel. Uh, uh, hearing Kaya talking about uh, the questions that now are understood as critical, imminent and reasonable. They were not understood in that way before, as Kaya was, was saying. Uh, Gavin's message about the need to really bear in mind that investment is going to become uh, difficult in this context and that we are hardly investing enough to sustain public transit, which is at the core of any equitable uh, mobility system anywhere in the world, uh, nevertheless making any improvements. Um, um, and again, has really sent her call to, to adapting to different realities, isn't it? And, and different geographies. Um, uh, Christian telling us about the existence of data, the existence of technologies, and the necessity for governments and private sector to work together. Um, well, Sheila, with all her trajectory across the COP, say, reminding us that we have to be clever and smart, but that there's notions there to be joyful. Well, you're really giving me the cue to, to try to go now into, into what do we should, what, what is it that we should be doing and we shouldn't be doing as we as we scale up? And only a couple of weeks ago, the uh, sustainable uh, low carbon transport community came together at the transport day that occurred in the race to, zero, uh, race to zero dialogues. And it was an opportunity for us to take stock on a series of, of messages. Um, and some of those messages I think have recurrently been coming up this morning as well. Um, well, um, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the interconnection between transport and energy and jobs and women and 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 and, and resilience and cities. This has come up again this morning, I, I believe, and it has shown us to what extent uh, transport is a proof of that groundswell for systemic transformation across socio-economic systems uh, of our entire societies. And I think we've also heard the necessity. Uh, for, for, for parties to the Paris Agreement to really embrace uh, carbon, uh, transport decarbonization in their nationally determined contributions and the long term climate strategies, and to enable uh, those balanced and multimodal uh, avoid, shift, and improve strategies that are so central to a notion of uh, sustainable low carbon transport. And we have also seen. And to what extent transport decarbonization measures are going to be central to any equitable and green socioeconomic recovery. And a couple of weeks ago, we could also see how um, uh, well uh, there's different solutions that are being tested in different regions and to what extent we must focalize and target the solutions to the context 
specificities and to the efficiency and the effectiveness that is required across different geographies, whether it is zero emission freight in Asia, whether it is needs for resilient infrastructure in Africa, or transport, public transport and urbanization and electrification in Latin America, for instance. And just to tell you a bit more of what happened a couple of weeks ago, it was also an opportunity to see to what extent heavy transport sectors across uh, land uh, transportation, but also shipping and aviation are rallying around pathways to try to accelerate the uptake of zero emission technologies in the next five to 10 years. And to what extent the zero emission vehicle campaign of COP26 is a unique opportunity to accelerate the race to zero in, non, in, in road transport, as Sheila was reminding us a couple of minutes ago. We could also see, and I, we are seeing it again today, to what extent the face of transport and, and its ecosystems are changing, and to what extent when we all come together across governments, across civil society, private sector and academia, and we're really engaging in what one of the speakers of this final seminar likes to call radical collaboration, we can really get much farther and much and much faster. And last but not least, Kaja has showed us to what extent we really have a guiding light in our young leaders who are fighting towards transport decarbonization, reimagining business models, investment, political leadership, knowledge generation, and, and activism as well, taking us accountable to really try to put this sector, which is not on track uh, for, for on emissions, uh, and, and really try, try to move towards, towards action. So to go a bit, bit uh, deeper into all these reflections, we are really spoiled with quite a, with quite a panel. It is my absolute honor to, to introduce to you uh, Mr. Nigel Topping, who is the United Nations High Level Climate Action Champion for COP26. We also have with us Dr. Kim, Secretary General of the International Transport Forum at the OECD. And last but not least, Mr. Christoph Wolf, who is Head of Global Mobility at the World Economic Forum. I'm going to start with Nigel because I know that Nigel has got another commitment that is forcing him to, to, to leave us in, in, a few, in a few moments. But, uh, well, I was talking about the Race to Zero Dialogues and really nobody better than one of the brains behind the Race to Zero campaign and the Race to Zero Dialogues to tell us how do you think, Nigel, that this Race to Zero campaign can actually help scale up the, the, the action towards transport decarbonization and scale it up in the right direction, isn't it? Because there's do's and there's don'ts. So tell us a bit about the campaign and how you think it can support us, please. Thank you, Marusha. Lo lovely to join you. Um, I mean, I think... I think it can work at two levels. First of all, is I mean, you know, the it is a race. It's worth remembering that we, and I think it's a race at multiple levels. It's a it's it's a societal race. Like we know the urgency of tackling this problem in terms of the economic damage and the human damage that not tackling it causes. So, and it's a race that, as we've often said, we can only win if we're all in it together. But it's also, of course, a race of national competitiveness. And as I've reminded people many times that um, if I can take a historical example, which is long, long enough in the past that no, it doesn't feel like I'm blaming anyone. Where in, the, in the first oil crisis in the early 70s, the US automotive industry got it completely wrong um, and can, thought they could continue building big gas guzzlers so as a result, of which they lost massive market share. So the industry and the regulators in the US got that completely wrong. That, that could happen again now at a country level, but also at a company level. I mean, if you look at Fiat Chrysler paying Tesla $2 billion, that's a kind of weird way to, to, to compete, right? Is mm -hmm. to pay your competitor. <laughs> um, or, or just just today yeah. I've seen um, Exxon, have just had to write off $20 billion. Mm -hmm. So I think the real issue is this, this is a race and it is happening really fast and it will happen exponentially. So that's the second bit is the sort of sort of work that, that, that you and Christoph and many others are doing and like, what is the pathway, particularly in the next 10 years? And the one thing that I just want to get across to people is just read your history books. This kind of transition never happens slowly, never happens linearly, always happens exponentially. And if you I know if you speak to some of the CEOs who are late to the game, as many of them have been, they are privately cursing themselves that they didn't start a lot earlier. It's very hard to catch up an exponential curve. So I think the most important thing in the, between now and Glasgow is that we really do land the clarity of where we're going. You know, zero carbon buses 2030, zero carbon cars 2035, zero carbon trucks 2040, so, and, the, and the leaders will get there five or 10 years faster. And the last, Marisha, we've talked about this before, I really think we have to move away from avoid shift improve. I know what you're going to say. You knew I'd say that. Because, I tell you why, because it's a really good framing because yeah. it because it, it's just uh -huh. like, in, it, it, but I would say let's change it to zero yes. avoid <laughs> shift because if we if we take that as a avoid then shift then improve we'll be too late 
Um, so it, it's, it keeps the same idea of there are, it's more than just electric vehicles. I know that's one of the important things of the void mm -hmm. shift improved. Mm -hmm. It's about intermodal shifts. It's about, it's about active transport. But if we make the intermodal shifts in the active transport and don't get to zero on those kind of time frames, then we won't be in line with the science. So what I, I would vote for shifting it to zero avoid shift. Um, and, and, um, and I think the most important thing between now and Glasgow is that we achieve kind of breakthrough momentum in countries, cities, businesses along the value chain and investors aligning around those what are now actually kind of medium term goals and then committing and demonstrating that they're in action along the short term goals. So no, no, no one wants to know what the plans are for 2040. It's about what we're actually doing in the next two and three years to make sure we're on those S curves to get there. Excellent. So you're really underscoring that notion of urgency, and and I and I really get your point, eh, Nigel. Every time you join us, which you join us actually very often, and we and we certainly you know love you for always carving out time for us. And so race to a national competitiveness, a bit of a of a constructive jealousy, isn't it? So let me take that notion of constructive jealousy and um, tell us a bit how can we use constructive jealousy within our movement? What do you think we should be prioritizing? In the next 12 months as we head towards COP26 because the clock is ticking already next thing we know we're going to be in Glasgow isn't it so what do you think we should be particularly paying attention over the next 12 months I think I think we should just look at the league tables of clear ambition amongst the vehicle for which vehicle manufacturers have actually been very clear mm -hmm. that they're committed to getting to zero and have plans in the next five years to develop the product portfolio to get the, the rating agencies and the investors are starting to demand this. So, but, but you can see some of the vehicle manufacturers have got very clear plans to get to zero by 2039 or 2040. Some of them are still silent. I think I think that's a risk for them in terms of attracting engineering talent and future customers. Same thing with countries. I think there's 17 countries now committed. Of course, the UK has just formed this ZEV Council, hoping to get more count more, more more countries on board and and cities. Um, also, I think re really, and, and this whole idea of the 15 minute city and, um, mm. and, and the, I think the acceleration amongst mayors of ambition. So I think those, those would be the, I the, other, the other thing, Marusha, I think we need to pay more attention to is the, the, the laggards and those who are deliberately lowballing and slowing things down. There are some countries in Europe who have been very slow to get behind the level of ambition needed for the EU to reach its ambitious climate targets and there are and there are some trade bodies um, who have I frankly been captured by um, those who want to slow down and, and we need to bring that out into the light and have some robust conversations I actually think it's got to the point where trade bodies who are trying to slow down are acting against the interests of their members um, and so members need to start calling them out and we start to see um, some examples in Europe of some of the vehicle manufacturers distancing themselves from some of the trade body positions I think we'll see a lot more of that um, in the next 12 months. So overall, you, you're always an optimistic. And, and a couple of minutes ago, you mentioned that notion of, of three Cs, as we call it, for instance, the Transport Decarbonization Alliance call it, uh, these are the three Cs, the countries, the cities and the companies working together. And the fourth C of citizens, isn't it? Uh, that, that, that is all uh, so, so essential. And lovely as well to hear you talk about uh, that notion of, uh, of proximity policies, the, the, the 15 minute city, which is very much at the, at the very center, isn't it, of that notion of avoid, shift and improve that yeah. you and I are always debating. So that connection between transport planning and urban planning is, is in oftentimes we seem to, uh, to, to be missing it, absolutely. And uh, yeah, well, raising ambition, isn't it? Uh, trying to perhaps, uh, one point that we haven't touched, uh, Nigel, is perhaps the notion of capacity, isn't it? Trying to identify uh, what are the reasons that are making uh, some of the countries potentially being being laggers, perhaps uh, unintentionally, isn't it? And how we can support them. I'm pretty sure that this is a notion that that Dr. Kim can can pick up later on, because from the ITF and certainly uh, Crystal from the World Economic Forum, they are trying to do a, a lot to support countries in that uh, in that increased ambition. But uh, the clock is ticking, and I know you got a commitment that that you know uh, forces you to leave us in the next five minutes. Um, I can't resist myself. I really can can hold myself. Uh, you know, I just want a bit of a scoop. I know that nobody's watching, nobody's listening. So tell us a bit, what is coming next in the race uh, to zero campaign? How can we best engage in it? How can we, you know, best prepared yeah. to, to maximize our engagement in it and actually maximize the overall impact, you know, to, to scale up uh, action uh, around the right, uh, the right direction? Well, I, I think that, you know, so far, most people see the race to zero as just about headline commitments, like how many companies, how many cities, how many countries commit to 
net zero. I think what's what next is really about is the is the pathways work, which you and many others in the Marrakesh partnership and Christoph and the, the whole WEF team, I know many people working on pathways so that we have a, a clear idea of what needs to happen in the next five and 10 years at the policy level along the value chain investors. Um, so, so that when we get to Glasgow, we can actually have conversations, which um, as some of the early speakers are saying, demonstrate that we've reached a breakthrough level of commitments in terms of critical mass, but also that we're on track to delivering those. It's not just future promise or jam tomorrow, we sometimes say in English, right? It's not jam tomorrow, it's jam today. It's what's actually happening. Um, and, and, and also that that's across the different sectors. So it's not cars, there's a lot of focus on, but um, I think there's some really exciting stuff happening um, and, uh, uh, in heavy freight. And we're starting to see the pathway. I, th I think I saw a coalition of 62 European companies committing to 100,000 um, hydrogen um, freight vehicles by 2030. That's on track to um, full decarbonisation by 2035, which we know is possible. So I think um, more clarity um, beyond cars um, and, and beyond road transport to shipping and aviation. I know Christoph's doing a lot of work on that. Um, and then some of the enabling technologies. I think um, there's a lot of work going on and um, we think there might be some exciting news soon around some uh, industry coalitions on the supply side for hydrogen. Back to your point about enabling, you can't have 100,000 hydrogen fuel cell trucks on the European roads if you don't have the hydrogen and the and the refueling infrastructure. So I think that whole whole systems approach will be much more. Excellent. Nigel, I think you're muted for a moment. So just so you know that you went into mute. Oh, sorry. Somebody, it's it's, the, it's the, the, the puppet master's shutting me up. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> now you're back. Now you're back. It's perfect. Yeah, well, you've picked up on freight, which is a point with which we started today. We had a Minister Van Bo, uh, Hoven from, from the Netherlands making really a plea for more attention on, on freight and, and the big work that is being done there and, and the further work that actually should be should be done. Um, Nigel, thank you so very much for joining us, really. It's been a pleasure to have you. I really appreciate you've carved out, even if it's a, a few more minutes. We're going to try to, you know, pick up some of the notions you left with us. We release you. Uh, right, stay thank safe, you, happy, social, and, and see you soon again. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you, Marisha. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. So let me turn now towards um, um, towards Christoph and towards Dr. Kim, and um, and I was saying earlier on to what extent uh, this has been a, a collective effort, isn't it, in the in the race to zero dialogues, um, and and Christoph from the World Economic Forum, uh, you've been central to pulling together the sessions on a shipping and aviation that took place within the race to zero dialogues. And um, we know to what extent there are still challenges, but also good news in those, uh, in those uh, modes towards decarbonisation. From what you heard at the Race to Zero Dialogues, what do you think are some of those prevailing challenges uh, towards accelerating decarbonisation in these two modes? But also equally importantly, what has given you a bit more optimism compared to five years ago? Over to you, Krista, please. Yeah. Um... Good morning, Marusha. Thanks for, for having me. Um, uh, very exciting to be here. So the race to zero was just uh, two weeks ago. And I think we're currently um, um, working on these things and, and talking about these things in, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the bigger public at, a, at, a, at an increasing speed or a pace, at, as it seems. So, um, and this is uh, probably along the lines of the race to zero where we're all, where we're all part of. Um, well, uh, you asked me about shipping and aviation. So shipping and aviation were commonly referred to uh, as, the hard, uh, as part of the hard to abate sectors. And, um, uh, and they are a global sector, so they're, they can't be so easily be uh, completely um, covered by the NDCs. And that, that's therefore, um, in, uh, um, when we did the Paris Agreement all together, um, uh, shipping aviation was not part of that. Yeah. So, uh, but a lot of things are happening there, and um, the uh, and one of the big um, big advantages that uh, these sectors have, they have a global regulator in, in the shipping um, on the shipping side. It's uh, the International Maritime Organization based in London. Uh, on on aviation, it's ICAO based in Montreal, and both of them actually have moved forward. Um, uh, quite significantly, uh, I would say. So both have a, a, a have a have commitments which are not yet Paris compatible. So they're basically um, uh, aviation has committed to a, a carbon um, neutral growth and to uh, minus four, uh, fifty percent, and the same is true for for IMO. But um, while we are speaking, um, a lot of action is happening uh, in order to really become a Paris compatible. 
And the good news is um, it is technically possible and there are pathways in order to um, make it possible. Um, I can let me talk about shipping first. Uh, so we know that um, efficiency and operations actually would account for uh, reducing ca current carbon emissions by, by, by 40%, but they're sometimes not so easy to get to. So you talk about slow speeding and things like that. And the other half, or more, maybe more than, needs to come through by, um, by uh, basically green shipping fuel. Today it's a heavy fuel oil. This is basically if you, uh, the, 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 the dirtiest part of the whole oil extraction process is actually, if you look at it, it's actually terrible, terrible stuff that gets the cheap mm -hmm. stuff that actually gets, mm -hmm. uh, that, that gets burned in the ship vessels. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, it's really, you know, you, you've seen, pic you all have seen pictures of, you know, ships uh, actually breaking apart and then, you know, all, all everywhere. So killing nature, killing birds, killing, killing everything. So, so this stuff has to go. Yes, this stuff has to go. And uh, so there are now um, uh, plans out there to move to other fuels and, uh, and the ship engine manufacturers, they say they, it can, they can do it, yeah, they can do it. Um, and it's either, I mean, the, the industry has to fully uh, decide over the next two or three years uh, on, on what is the right fuel, is it green ammonia, is it, uh, is it methanol, et cetera, and then have to put ships on the water by 2025 uh, demo projects and by 2030, uh, ships on the world that actually uh, um, are zero zero emission vessels, and we're working with the we've putting together put together with the global maritime forum. They're getting to zero collision. Uh, the getting to zero collision uh, has brought together a hundred more than a hundred players from all from the whole globe, basically from all continents, and they're basically uh, committing uh, to a, a net zero pathway to to twenty fifty. Uh, and it's a multi-stakeholder coalition. It has shippers, uh, it has ship owners, it has financiers, it has ports, it has uh, basically everybody who is part of the of the of the maritime industry working together because otherwise it's not possible in order to make that change happen. Uh, you've seen you've seen uh, in, um, initiatives like the Poseidon Principles, where basically the ship financing banks say they're con they're 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 moving their complete portfolio. And it's actually, besides a technically possible, um, um, it's, it's basically these three levers. It's, it's a policy lever. So uh, IMO will hopefully um, encouraged by all the progress and, and with its 195 countries will hopefully uh, over 20, uh, 2023 um, have the confidence actually to move the needle to net zero. Yeah? And, but, but what's equally important is private sector action. Yeah, so shippers, basically, they're saying they are willing to pay premium because it's, it's chicken and egg. Yeah, so the, the current, the, the future zero carbon options are, uh, are going to be more expensive at an early stage until it actually scales, until green ammonia is coming down with the price uh, based on green hydrogen prices. And, um, and so it's private sector and public sector and the finance sector actually working together in order to make that happen. And I could similarly talk about aviation, but maybe I, I give the Thank floor back to you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. So no, yeah, you're showing us that indeed there is a political complexity that is part of the UNFCCC rounds and of the reality of, of different countries there, but how things are moving, isn't it, compared to five years ago. Uh, you gave us a date, 2025, for demo projects to be there uh, in, in 25. Exactly. So 25, that's, yeah. that's, that's mm -hmm. quite, a, quite, a, quite already a deadline here, very close to us. Uh, policy levers, uh, private sector engagement, finance. Well, this is a lot of what the ITF does as well and knows very well how to do. Dr. Kim is lovely to share a panel once more with you. For those watching us who may not know uh, the ITF and SLOCAT, we are actually partners in crime in the UNFCCC arena because we are co-focal points for the engagement of the transport sector in the, in the UNFCCC, and that's why we get to work together very, very often. So we are seeing that there's a lot of homework ahead of us, isn't it, uh, Dr. Kim? We're also seeing that the opportunities are there and that we must harness them. So from the, from the ITF perspective, what do you think we should be prioritizing when we scale up? What is it that we should be doing and we shouldn't be doing? Tell us a bit more, please. Thank you, thank you for inviting me and good to see you again, Arusa. And I know that the world is now working together um, more than ever before. And I think the changes are taking place in, in many ways. It's, it's really a good sign to, to all of us. But the, in terms of the do's and don'ts, and basically the first thing 
to mention is that we should continue to try to optimize platforms like ITF and slow cuts because platforms are like uh, interchanges and junctions on the road and uh, they are definitely a meeting point uh, between private sector and public sector and even uh, between uh, public sector uh, actors. And also uh, platforms should be uh, uh, linked together in a very uh, the smooth way and productive way. And uh, in that sense, uh, the recent organization of Race to Zero campaign and other international events are really uh, meaningful uh, at this stage. And this is really good for uh, raising awareness of the importance of this uh, question. And especially international organization, I mean, international platforms should play a role of uh, bringing some concrete uh, the evidence to convince people in even in transport sector and also in other sectors. And in the sense, uh, for example, last July, uh, ITF launched the TCAT, the Transport Climate Action Directory, containing more than 60 measures that government can use. And every measure listed on this directory has a quantifiable impact, even though it's not uh, perfectly suitable for the, uh, for the reality, but it's a living document and incorporating with our uh, the global partners uh, that should be upgraded and updated but uh, it's really important it's in the sense that it's an official reference, not only for the transport people, but also for the environment people and uh, other people and scholars. And it was endorsed by UNFCCC. So basically it's an official reference for everybody. And uh, I think uh, this kind of uh, things we, we, we should continue to do. And in terms of the don'ts, uh, in terms of the don'ts, and it is really uh, simple because we should not uh, repeat the same uh, rhetoric or same ideological uh, things rather than uh, concrete evidence or concrete actions. So um, we, we should uh, collect data and evidence and best practices to share with our friends in the world. And that's that's very important thing. And also we should go beyond the transport as well because sometimes we uh, find ourselves uh, stuck in silos. And if we become too much detailed and too much uh, you know, focused on a transport issue, we cannot really see the other things which can be more important. So these days, uh, connecting uh, our platform to other platforms is also very important. That's why uh, we uh, very much value the cooperation with SLOCAD and also World Economic Forum and recently, and I think we can create some uh, synergies as well. And also we should not uh, sing the same song all the time. And basically we should be creative to uh, bring new things uh, step by step in, in the future. I think that, that that's uh, the basic thing that we can really uh, think about today. Excellent. Well, Dr. Kim, thanks very much. Science-based targets, knowledge-based policy, helping our decision makers to know the cost of inaction and the, and the benefits, isn't it, across different uh, uh, public policy areas that, that go by the hand of uh, investing in, in transport decarbonization and certainly getting out of our comfort zone, whether it is to meet other sectors or whether it is to be creative, as you were saying. Thank you so very much. Let me go back briefly to Christoph. I'm a bit conscious of time, of course, and I just want to tell you both that we are running against the clock, as you know. It's always the, you know, the, the, the bad idea of being the last speakers in the morning. What can we do about it? But Christoph, uh, we tend to oftentimes talk about, I don't know, North American solutions or North American or European based or, or, or driven coalitions. Uh, why do you think we need to get out of that silo? Uh, and how can we do that? I think it's an excellent question. Um, and um, so I talked uh, about um, shipping before, and um, I think it's the in aviation, the global regulators are KO, and whenever I come uh, to the um, building in, in Montreal, so it has a big uh, sign over the entrance, which says nobody, nobody left behind. Um, and I think this is an important, uh, this is an important statement. Um, uh, so I think in North America and in Europe, we need to be role models, but we need to think through what the, uh, the, what the policies and the technology solution actually, what's the, what, what is the impact on the whole world? Um, and, um, and therefore, in aviation, um, uh, we have actually, uh, in, the, in the Clean Skies of Tomorrow Coalition with 80, 80 parties now, uh, we work along the same line. So it's, it's, a, it's a technology solution is there, uh, sustainable aviation fuels, maybe further along hydrogen and, uh, and electric for, for short haul of hydrogen uh, is maybe further along. Um, and it's, it's a finance lever, it's a policy lever and, um, uh, it's the demand, it's the private sector basically uh, honoring um, green solution. 
Um, but what we and what we did is actually we we went to India, yeah, and we spent actually half a year with many stakeholders about the same. And you know, Indians are always very, um, you know, have a lot of are very creative. It's not about singing the same song. It's actually you know finding lots of uh, levers and communities, etc., that actually can contribute. And then we actually went the whole cycle. Yeah, what is technically possible? What are the cost curve? What does it do to farmers? What does it do to GDP? What does it do to mm -hmm. jobs? Um, and basically, and, and, and create confidence because often uh, uh, emerging markets look at this and say, well, it's going to be expensive. I mean, in shipping, it's important because it's a cost of trade. It's basically a cost of being connected in aviation. It's a cost of actually being connected to the world. I mean, there's a, only 10% of people have flown and the rest wants to fly as well. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it needs to be equitable. And therefore, actually, we think we have to go bottom up and we have to create the confidence in, in for the 195 uh, countries along across the globe that at the end of the day, if you want to do want to make global policy changes they actually all have to confirm that it is also for them thank you so very much so indeed a plea for uh, equity amongst nations isn't it and, and and taking the conversations at a global scale as you are saying thank you so very much in the interest of time last but not least at all dr king what are the plans of the itf to take the messages that we had at race to zero all the way to cop 26 at Glasgow? I think we are on the on the on the on the way to COP26, and um, uh, during this journey to uh, Glasgow, uh, we are preparing a lot of interesting events uh, ahead of us. And basically, as we did uh, in in the previous years, and we are we are planning to organize a decarbonizing or decarbonizing transport focused session at the at the next summit in Leipzig, mm -hmm. and also we continue to uh, publish. Uh, the DT uh, decarbonizing transport related uh, research papers. We, we usually produce between 50 and 60 uh, the papers annually, but uh, a good number of the papers are related to decarbonizing uh, the transport issues. And also uh, we continue to work with the uh, international partners like SLOCAD and uh, World Economic Forum once again. And um, especially uh, what we plan to do uh, uh, this year actually uh, was that no, last year was last year. If we, we don't have, know which year we are living in, isn't it? <laughs> Crazy months. <laughs> because we are stuck in office all the time these days. <laughs> I don't really yeah, remember. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, when uh, the, the Chile was preparing for the, the COP25 in, in Santiago, and at the time we got an invitation from a Minister of Transport and Minister of Environment uh, at the same time. So they already showed a great cooperation in their country and I think that's really uh, meaningful and important. And what we what we need to do is to uh, make our voice and in, mm. in, uh, in uh, COP meetings and transport folks are not really admitted to the discussion tables. And we are somewhere around in, in COP meetings, but uh, definitely next year, we will uh, raise our voice and uh, we will try to uh, organize very interesting events that can make a really productive echoes on, on, on so many uh, partners. Mm -hmm. And especially UK is now uh, the vice presidency of ITF. So we are already starting to, uh, to discuss uh, what should be uh, made in, in Glasgow next year. Excellent. So uh, let's- we know let's... political opportunity, isn't it? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Keen. And you also allowed us to pick upon one of the big announcements of this opening session, uh, because if you remember, all of you watching us, uh, uh, Gloria Hutt, the minister, for transport and telecommunications of Chile announced a series of uh, technical policy dialogues spamming throughout the next day, few months to help us go deeper into certain certain topics and certainly pick up the button from uh, from that say uh, push that uh, the COP25 presidency gave to uh, sectoral discussions to land the climate action discussions into sectors whether it is transport energy and so on and so forth so thank you very much dr keen thank you very much christoph it's been wonderful to share a few moments only a few moments with you the good news is that we know that the collaboration goes farther and that we work much more together so uh, big thanks for having up time again and it is really now time for me to to wrap up what has been this opening session i hope that we have passed on a clear message the message that a sustainable low carbon transport is as much about climate action as it is about equity and social justice. I hope you have seen that there is transport decarbonization leadership out there, that the technical solutions do exist, and that you're also assured that we're not fooling ourselves. 
that we do appreciate completely the challenges that prevail across road transport, shipping and, and aviation. But the deep ambition of the sustainable low carbon transport movement is really on the rise. On the rise to, to find the solutions that are context adapted and that are cost efficient for the different realities across, uh, across different geographies of, of the world. As I am wrapping up, um, I really want to invite you to join us for the nine thematic sessions and the closing session that we will be having over the next days. As you see, there is much more in store that we have prepared for us. And this has been the collective effort of all the little logos you see there, of all the big entities that are behind these, because yes, and Route to COP26 has been a joint endeavor. From all of us, from all the co-organizers of this event, a heartfelt thanks to our speakers and our moderators who are carving out time throughout the next day, few days to join us. And of course, to our global audience who is watching us live across different, uh, different time zones. I actually want to personally also give a big thanks to the colleagues in the um, co-organizing entities and of course, to my teammates in the SLOCAT Secretariat and the TVA Secretariat. They are my dream team. Absolutely. We hope you will enjoy the program ahead and, 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 and certainly keep on engaging on social media. Uh, hashtag, as you can see there, our road to COP26. And um, please register. There is still time to join us. All the very best and really hoping and looking forward to seeing you in any of the thematic sessions or at the latest in the closing on Thursday. Thank you very much and bye only for now. <laughs>